Tá carregando aqui, só um momento. Foi, mas aí eu acho que foi pro meu, né? Uhum. Aqui. Deixa eu ver pra... Ah, não, já foi direto pro BT, já. Perfeito. Aí eu vou pegar o link e vou te mandar aqui no chat. O link do quê? O link do, do vídeo. No YouTube, sim. Agora a gente vai ter o link para divulgar. Finalmente. Tá aí, tá no chat. Perfeito. O pessoal tá pedindo o link Eu do não YouTube. No, no grupo. Não recebi, Diana. Tá no chat aqui do Zoom, mas eu posso te mandar ah, pelo WhatsApp. Tá. Só nós que teremos esse, esse link do YouTube, né? Gente, a gente já tá ao vivo, não, tá? Não, do, do YouTube não. Não, do, do... Eu tô decidindo aqui com a minha cachorra se ela quer ficar no quarto ou se ela vai sair. Ô, Lady, eu vou te tirar daqui, tá? Deixar só a nata. Sim, aí na minha hora você devolve para mim, né? Na, na, na minha hora. Vai estar tá aqui vendo ainda, tá? Eu só vou te tirar aqui da tela. Da câmera, tá certo. É o dourado, Renata. Resp... Ok. Tamara também... E eu? O <risos> que, que eu faço comigo? <risos> que eu não posso ser atendi? Você fica aí de host? Só desliga o microfone, né? E a câmera, não sei se você quiser ficar com a gente. É, não tem como eu sair daqui, eu tenho que ficar aqui. Uhum. Então... Estamos no YouTube. So, Professor Aysa, as I was telling you, I, I used to live in Paraná, the west of Paraná. So, oh, yeah, where Paraná exactly? Cascavel. Oh, in Cascavel. I'm, I'm home-based in Cascavel, yeah. Ah. Yeah, That's I right. teach at the west, but uh, for a long time, I mean, For a long time, and a long time ago, I, I was a teacher at Unipar. Uh, in fact, there was a moment when I was teaching at both uh, universities. Um, I enjoyed my time there at Unipar. But, you know, li the literature course there, um, uh, uh, they, they simply phased out. We don't have yeah. literacy mm -hmm. at Unipar anymore. That's a shame. Mm -hmm. I've been to Foz Iguaçu once in 2007, I think. To watch you, just to, to see. Oh yeah, we uh, because I had I had uh, a store in Foz do Iguaçu. We were specialized in uh, books for uh, I mean language teachers, and uh, then uh, in Foz do Iguaçu we used to have some uh, one day seminars. I started the brass pistol chapter there. Really? But then it was too much work. Yeah. And then I, I simply passed that on to other people, but they gave up. Oh, that's a shame. But I've we been have... a brass diesel. Uh, let me let me let me check here. I think I was a brass. Uh, uh, let me check here. I've been a brass diesel member. Let's see. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> over, yeah, my my number. Let me see if I can find my number here. Wow, that's amazing. Yes, let, let me check here. Let me check on this. I, I think they have my number there. Um, where is he? So. Um, let me check the email.
while you you try to find your number, mm -hmm. I will uh, start this event. Okay. Is that okay? <laughs> That's fine. That's so fine. we are almost. It's almost two o'clock. So thank you very much for everyone who is here, who is here with us uh, on the YouTube channel. So uh, here, uh, before you could see our timetable of this event. And in this event, we are going to talk about what does it mean to be an English teacher today? Uh, in the end of this event, we will have a lucky draw where three people will win a 50% discount in an English uh, course for one semester at Albus Idiomas. So stay tuned and participate in the end that maybe you're going to have something good for you. Uh, so our first our uh, speaker today is Professor Jose Carlos Aisa. So it's an, an honor for me, especially because I know his work for a long time and I really admire our work. So thank you very much for accepting our invitation and the floor is yours. He was trying to find how long he's a BT member. No. <laughs> Well, I didn't find my number. Yeah. Well, thank you, Renata, for welcome, welcoming me. And uh, thank, thank you uh, and your colleagues at the uh, Brest Iso Rondonia chapter. It's an honor. I'm here in Paraná, and uh, it's incredible. The pandemic brought several un uh, un unpleasant things to us, but it also brought many um, wonderful things. Uh, we can be connected uh, regardless of where we are in the world, not only in Brazil or not only in, in, uh, in our states. Mm -hmm. So uh, you see, you got to um, watch the presentation at uh, Dizal uh, and now I'm here with you. And it's funny because now we're using these words like here and there. <laughs> Uh, they they seem not to mean anything anymore. That's true. Because we're everywhere, right? And so um, I'm really thankful. Um, I was you you can't imagine when you sent me the email with the invitation how happy I was, and I didn't even know that you had lived in Cascabel, where I am now. Um, I I really didn't find my my member number my membership number, um, but I. You see, I started teaching when I was 16 years old. They didn't have many good English teachers around, so they, they would employ anyone. <laughs> I guess I was <laughs> one of them. Uh, but I've been a Breast Soul member for about 20 years, I guess. Wow. Uh, yeah. And uh, uh, I started, uh, as I was telling you, a chapter in uh, Fosri Iwasu. Uh, I lived there for some time, but then uh, I, I moved to Cascabel, which is a nearby city for those who do not know it. And then I couldn't handle the, 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 the administrative stuff um, of the chapter anymore. And unfortunately, um, then it didn't, um, I, I mean, people were not committed uh, because I know it's, it's a lot of work. What you're doing today has taken a lot of your hours for many, many weeks, I suppose, yeah. right? So anyway, uh, without further ado, I, 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 cannot, I cannot really thank you enough. And I'm, I'm so thrilled. I am thankful. You can't imagine how amazing it is to me to be here with you, who is mm -hmm. my, like uh, a person that I follow the job for years. That's a really pleasure for me. And uh, let's hope uh, not only the two of us, but uh, you know, uh, everyone that is watching us, we can maybe uh, strengthen um, sure. our bonds and um, do more for the teaching of English in Brazil. Not sure. because it's English, but because it's necessary. Because That's it's necessary true. for Brazilians, right? So before you start, I forgot yes. to introduce a little bit of you, <laughs> your CV and biodata for all the, the people who are watching us. So before we start, um, Professor Isa is going to talk about the English teacher today and tomorrow. What has systems thinking got to do with it? So uh, this talk will focus on three main trends of these disruptive changes, robotization, extreme longevity, and geographical dispersion. It aims to serve as food for thought. 
which might, may help the educators, whether in teaching or in management positions, to start thinking and acting more proactively in the face of an almost uh, insurmountable wave of creative destruction of jobs, result, resulting in the survival of those who become more efficient in these three activities, human interaction, problem solving, and creativity. If we understand this new scenario, we can begin to see beyond the border of the classroom into the broader context of our students' life. And who is him? Who is Aisa? I talk a lot, a, a lot about you. So Aisa is a Letas graduate. He holds an MA at Penn State University and a PhD at UNES, a degree in comparative literature. He has been an English teacher for 42 years and a higher education professor in the field of ELT and comparative literature for over 20 years. His work experience also includes management position in private language institutions and K-12 schools as principal and coordinator of bilingual programs. Portuguese language professor, undergraduate and graduate level courses at Penn State University, two years, teacher development and training activities, free service and in service, 22 years, activities as certified translator and interpreter. His current interests are also related to proactive innovation and people-oriented leadership vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the search for sustainable excellence in the ELT profession. So now the floor is yours or the screen is yours. Thank I'll you be very here much. and in the end of the presentation, uh, maybe you're going to have some questions and then we'll, uh, we're, we're, I'll be we're here We're going again. to welcome questions, yes. Um, well, okay, so um, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, let's hope everything works. I think it's working. Yes, I can see. Um, okay, so the, the title is 360 Degree Thinking demands a 180 degree turnaround. Change is slow until it isn't. And that's exactly it. Um, maybe, and it's hard to think of when exactly, maybe uh, a few years ago, uh, we didn't perceive change as we are perceiving it now. It seems that everything is changing all the time. Uh, maybe you've already heard of the chaos theory, and uh, the, the, that theory uh, mentions the fact that, uh, you know, there's always the process of uh, a lot of change, and then for some time there is stability, and then change again. Uh, I believe that we are noticing that maybe the... Um, what is really happening all the time seems to be change and not stability anymore. But that is because of our perception of how time is passing and um, maybe because we're too busy with so many details um, that we didn't have before. We didn't have cell phones, we didn't have um, uh, the internet, we didn't have uh, so much information in front of us. Uh, that sometimes our heads are so busy with so much that we don't notice how time is passing really. I'm not going to go into details or into the, the theory that some people say that time is passing faster than before. I think anyway, our perception of how, how time is passing is completely different exactly because we've got so much um, on our laps and in our hands and therefore in our heads. Uh, and that's the idea of change being slow until it isn't. Uh, we don't perceive some changes happening because of the process uh, that is involved in change. And then one day uh, it's not changing anymore, it has already changed. And that is what happening to the profession, to our profession. Uh, many people, um, of my generation, uh, I can see that very clearly. Most of you may be very young, uh, and then uh, you're just noticing things at the speed that they are happening now. 
but I've been able to experience due to age and due to my birth date, uh, I've been able to experience um, um, changes in, in a much, um, uh, happening much more slowly than things happen now. Uh, and, and what I'm going to discuss with you is based on other people's thinking. And uh, that's why I would like to, uh, to show this uh, slide to you. I think that what we do is usually based on what we think. So why not borrow a few smart thoughts from others, from others who may be smarter than we are, or at least have been thinking about these uh, things more intensively than we have. And so what I propose to do is to give you food for thought. You know, in, in these 42 years in the profession, I've con I'm convinced that uh, that's what I am. I am a provider of food for thought um, for, for my students. Um, uh, the thinking really happens in their heads. The decisions are theirs. Um, I might provide some food that will help them decide what to do, um, even if they make mistakes, but they will be reflective beings. They will be thinking about uh, what they need to do for their own uh, uh, benefit. So let's borrow these ideas from these other people who, are th who I think are smarter than I, at least I am. Uh, I will start with the, uh, the idea of change then. Um, that's, what, that's what we're living every day, right? We're living changes in, in every sense, social changes, professional changes, scientific changes, changes, right? That's it. So what do you think when you, uh, when you think of change in your life? In general, young people like the idea of change. Uh, older people might not like it so much. Uh, it really depends on personality, I think, and what we're actually living. Of course, if you're living a very difficult situation, you want change to happen. But many of us simply um, have a tendency, and human beings, I think, are, are like that. We, we, ha we are happy to find a comfort zone. And sometimes in this comfort zone, because it's comfortable, we don't want to change or we don't want, to, uh, we don't want change to happen. But that's, that's not what uh, actually uh, occurs in our lives. Change does happen, right? And I have the butterfly there as a, uh, as a symbol of the idea of change. And because in fact, um, the, the change that happens uh, uh, to a butterfly is incredible, right? And maybe that's the way we have to start thinking about what happens to us uh, uh, and, and not just uh, hang on to our comfort zone. Uh, so that's the idea. The butterfly is a, is a big symbol of change and a big positive symbol. And I think that's, that's what we have to uh, strive and maybe uh, um, make an effort to um, uh, consider. Change is a possibility for something very positive. Um, there may be pains uh, involved definitely, but um, uh, these pains uh, might be uh, or might lead us to something extremely ple uh, pleasant and positive. Um, uh, we're, we're not going to have uh, the option. I, I thought of using Mentimeter and other, other um, uh, apps or, 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 or sites uh, to make this uh, a little bit more uh, interactive, but uh, maybe for us to save a little bit more time for discussion, I will uh, simply ask questions. And then I think, as I said, if it's food for thought, then you, you answer that to yourself and or maybe uh, share that uh, in, in, uh, with, with colleagues. Uh, I chose this picture because it's actually, you know, there's an elephant in the room, really. And uh, I wanted to show you that sometimes the elephant was um, the small elephant in the room and people didn't notice um, the, the elephant there. And the one day, and that's it, changes slow until it isn't, one day the big elephant is there and we were paying attention to other things. 
And this happens because um, uh, sometimes what we have is this feeling that we're always, or at least more and more often at crossroads. Don't you have that feeling nowadays that you're always having to make decisions, that things are not uh, so easy anymore, or maybe depending on your age, they've never been easy. You've always felt like you were at crossroads and they, you, you have to, to make decisions all the time. And uh, this is quite stressful because you don't know if uh, taking this road or this or that road is the best option after all. But um, I don't know if you all agree, but it seems that we're, we're always making more decisions all the time, more and more decisions. Um, if you ask your grandparents, for example, how many decisions they've had to, made, to make in their lives, maybe you will be surprised that uh, their life uh, periods or the periods in their lives seem very, very clear, very uh, uh, um, well-defined. Whereas in our lives nowadays, it's all a big mess sometimes. We mix things. We, we are... Uh, uh, it's very hard to separate professional life from uh, family life, from uh, whatever kind of life you want to have. Uh, also, not only because of us, but because of what's happening around us, right? Um, and uh, I like to, to quote this verse from the Bible without any religious aspect. You see, it's, it's a blurred uh, window pane, and uh, uh, maybe you you know the beginning of the verse. It comes from uh, Saint Paul's first epistle uh, to the Corinthians, and the whole um, phrase is: "For now we see through a glass, but darkly. But then, face to face. Uh, now I know I am I now I know in part." But then I shall know even as also I am known. Of course, uh, St. Paul is referring to the possibility of uh, uh, meeting God. Uh, one day, face to face, uh, we will know more. We will know everything that we need to know, just as God knows us. So I shall know even as also I am known. But the, the metaphor to me is uh, seeing through a glass darkly actually means it's, it's an expression in English uh, that some people still use as an idiomatic expression that we cannot see the whole. We cannot see the whole picture. We only see a dim outline of things. And that's the feeling I have nowadays. Um, life seemed very, very clear uh, to me a few decades ago. Now, because of all the things that are happening, uh, and maybe it's not that those things were not happening. We were just not aware of those things because we didn't have the internet. We didn't connect all the time. We were not connected to the whole world all the time. So things were happening. The planet was still the, the planet. But the point nowadays is that because we know so much more, we have so much more information, we're pressed to make decisions to make choices. And uh, that's quite um, disturbing many times. What choice is the correct choice? And since the topic of this webinar has to do with uh, what is, uh, how can we define our profession nowadays? What, what, is, uh, what is a good English teacher nowadays? And what will be a good English teacher in the years to come? We'll have to make decisions. So my first food for thought um, comment has to do with this book uh, written by Peter Senge. Um, he is from um, the Massachusetts in Institute of Technology. And it's a book that uh, is not a recent book. I, mean, I bought it in, in the 1990s. Um, and there's this, uh, uh, quote from the book, which I, uh, which always, uh, even when I read it many years ago, caught my attention, that from an early age, we are taught to break apart problems, to fragment the world, 
This apparently makes complex tasks more manageable. Yes, that's what every teacher, every math teacher, in fact, tells us to do, to separate uh, uh, the elements of the problem so that we can understand the problem much better. So the, the, the problem becomes more manageable. But we pay an enormous hidden price when we do that. And what is this hidden price? We lose intrinsic sense of connection to a larger whole because the parts are never isolated. We, it's good to see the parts, but we have to see the whole. And what is uh, the, the problem with this approach that we learn in school, in fact, we're taught to fragment the world. And that's, that's maybe nowadays not a very good idea in our profession, in our personal life. We, can't, we have to see the whole and we have to see the parts. We cannot just do one, of the, one, one thing or the other thing. We have to see the forest, but we have to see the trees. Um, and another thing that this book made me think about was the idea of whole and healthy. Do you know that uh, th there's another expression, hale and hearty? We normally use this expression to describe a very healthy uh, person who uh, is a little bit older or at an old age, and we say that, oh, that, that old man is hale and hearty, meaning that he is healthy and um, uh, that uh, uh, considering his or her age, I mean, the person's age, that person is still doing very well because of um, uh, a healthy constitution and uh, um, still very lucid. Well, the book also helped me to think that Hale and Hearty, especially Hale, Hale in this case, meaning healthy, also means entire, unhurt. So actually whole and healthy have the same root in Old English. And so when we think about looking at things as a whole, we're actually looking at things in a healthy way, not frag fragmenting it all the time. And still, oops, sorry, uh, still thinking of this, uh, this book and the message it gave me, uh, Peter Senge says that uh, the first thing we have to do uh, is to try to eliminate this mismatch that uh, maybe even in our educational system, we teach people to believe that uh, fragmenting things make, uh, makes um, uh, problems more manageable. There is a mismatch between the nature of a reality in complex systems and uh, our predominant way of thinking about reality. Nature, uh, um, I mean, uh, uh, life is a complex system, not complicated necessarily, but complex. And usually because it's complex, the cause um, of our, I mean, the solution to one problem might be the cause of another problem. It's a solution at, at the moment, but because we're not looking at the whole, so we're not being healthy about the solution, we're uh, maybe creating the cause of another problem. So usually today's problems come from yesterday's solutions that we simply forgot about. So the first step to correct this mismatch is to let go of the notion that cause and effect are necessarily close in time and space. Oh, you see, I have this consequence here. The cause is here. Sometimes we simply cannot see the cause anymore. It started a long time ago. That's why change is slow until it isn't. We don't see the cause of the change anymore, but we see the effect, we see the consequence, and we, that's why it's not slow. Uh, it, 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 maybe it was even slow, but we have no idea of when it started because we forgot about the cause. We, we stopped looking at um, uh, life or anything as a complex system. And everything in life is a complex system. Our body is a complex system. We don't have a problem just in the liver. We don't have a problem only in our eyes. Um, you know, every dentist nowadays tells you that uh, the problems you have in your mouth can affect your heart, right? So it, this is, is a very good symbol of a complex system. 
And so 300, uh, 360 degree thinking in the age of interdependence, do you have any doubt that we're all interdependent? We all depend on each other. Anything that happens in China <laughs> will have an effect. And I'm not trying to be funny here, but will have an effect on everyone else. Systems thinking is the solution to this. It's not easy, but it can help. There is no outside. We and the cause of our problems, we are a single system. And the cure is the relationship that we develop with our enemy. So what we see as a problem, uh, if we just consider, uh, consider that as a problem, it's our enemy. What kind of relationship are we building with our enemies? We have to maybe involve that enemy in a systems thinking uh, environment. We have to look at the whole and not just at the part. Um, so systems thinking is a discipline for seeing holes and a framework for seeing interrelationships rather than things, for seeing patterns uh, of change rather than static snapshots. Uh, life is a film, not just static snapshots. When you look at a snapshot, you don't see the person. You don't see what really happens, right? I mean, when you look at your photograph when you were a child, that's not you. That's not, that's not the only thing about you, right? So uh, with this in mind, you may think, well, what has this got to do with English language teaching, with my profession? Exactly that. I think that in our comfort zone, if we only think about what we do in the classroom, the techniques we use, the kinds of methodologies that uh, we've had. And this is another example. I mean, you had grammar translation, you had audiovisual, you had audiolingual, you had uh, uh, um, uh, TPR, you have, uh, you have methodologies and you have approaches. But what do we do nowadays? You see, this is a complex issue. This is a complex system. It's not, but maybe, of course, it's much more interesting if I think, oh, oh the audiolingual method is, the method for me, because then we feel safe. It's not, it's not only, it's not a system anymore. It's just one part of a whole system. We have to stop looking at the snapshots. It's not snapshots. We have to look at the film. And this has to do with our profession. The second food for thought came from um, a, an MBA in uh, management that I took um, very recently, in fact, uh, very, very interesting course. And uh, what I learned uh, when we think about change and when we think about uh, um, systems thinking was a theory developed by Nikolai Kondratiev. He was an economist and he, in his studies, um, sort of uh, outlined a theory that shows not in a very precise way, but he shows that um, um, there are cycles, at least in the economic area or field, uh, of about 50 to 60 years between one cycle and the other. And every cycle has um, a phase of prosperity, a phase of uh, recession, a phase of depression and a phase of um, um, uh, evolution, right? Uh, in fact, the idea here is that it becomes, it can become, um, uh, uh, it is the, it's a phase of improvement, in fact, in the sense that uh, because it, 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 the E here stands for expansion. So every cycle will have these four phases. And he described, uh, starting in the 1800s, he described all of these cycles in society, at least in the Western society. Uh, and he, can, he could show, and, and then uh, other uh, researchers after him decided to, well, okay, what is the first Kondratiev uh, cycle? Um, what did it look like? And then they found um, they found um, uh, some 
truth in it. It corresponded to reality because it's a complex system. Uh, and we're living this cycle now, the 1980 to if it's 50 or 60 years, that might change a little bit, but to 2030. And therefore, we're still maybe in the, in the phase that he would call the phase of depression. I think we're all feeling that. We haven't started this phase of expansion and improvement. Well, this has nothing to do with astrology, even if you believe it. This has nothing to do with uh, fortune telling. This is based on scientific study, uh, which does not mean it's the whole truth. But at least it tries to show us that there is a system and it's complex here. So we see the parts, but we see the whole. And there will be a sixth Kondratiev uh, cycle, right? Probably after 2030. So how, how are you preparing for these cycles? How are you preparing yourself? How are you preparing yourself as a person and as a professional? Uh, uh, we're dealing with facts. We need facts, not fear, right? And here again is another way of describing the cycles. Um, I'm, I'm sure that, um, you know, I could not explain this to you in detail, but I studied a little bit about it and I saw that uh, it called my attention that change is slow until it isn't because we are not seeing those four phases in each cycle happen. We're too busy doing something else. But what are we in the, in the cycle that we are living now? What are the changes that are happening? So this, because if we just make a 360 degree turn, we'll end up in the same place where we were. For us to change things in our profession and maybe in our lives, we have to make a 180 turn around. Right? And for us to make this turnaround and be prepared for what is coming, maybe we have to analyze what um, the main uh, trends in society that will influence our profession. One of them is data or data, as you please. We have to become more familiar with how we're going to handle data. It's an, I mean, it's a lot of information. It's a lot of information. How are we going to organize that in our lives? How are we going to process information? Well, that comes to the part of analysis, right? Because in, in, before, oil was very important. Now, information is much more important than oil. In fact, they say that we're not going to have oil anymore. We'll have electric cars. We'll have I mean, oil is actually coming to the end in the world. So uh, the, 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 the comparison here, oil was, was very, very important before. Now, what is, what is the power really for people, information? And if we refined oil before, now we have to analyze information. We have to become much better at analyzing information. Therefore, we'll, use, we'll need to use our intelligence more and more, refine, uh, try new methods, try new, uh, new ways of thinking. That's what I'm proposing because we'll have to make decisions ahead. And uh, systems thinking is one, one, one way of, of, our, of using our intelligence. Before, oil was very important and the value was based on its scarcity. So you don't have it, you pay more for it, right? Now, the value of data is based on its connectivity. How do we connect this piece of information with that piece of information? And how do we innovate by connecting pieces of information? And of course, uh, this doesn't have to do with us exactly, but... Um, what has to be sustainable now, the new green is privacy. So we're all facing issues related to privacy. Fake news is related to privacy. Um, I mean, all these um, hacker attacks, um, are, um, that's connected to privacy. So all of us will, will be much more 
interested in keeping uh, our information uh, sort of secure somewhere. And that's, that's an issue for, for the future, certainly. Well, considering all those factors, um, the specialists, when they study the Kondratiev cycles, what they're describing in our cycle, it, there are three areas, the economic field, the technological field, and the social field. And there are a few things happening which will affect all of us as a person, or as people, but also as professionals. For example, I won't, I won't go into detail of all this, but people are, um, we have a, a population aging factor. People are getting older and older. They're not dying so because of medicine, because the advancement we have in medicine, the improvement, uh, so people can live much longer. In fact, there are um, uh, estimates that, uh, the young people, not me, maybe not some of you, will live about to be 120. And well, because of human enhancement technology, right? Because many of uh, but there will be consequences also, right? I mean, um, will robots take our places? Maybe not in teaching, maybe not in developing uh, programs, educational programs because human beings need the contact with other human beings to learn. But uh, we already know that artificial intelligence is doing a lot of what we call, um, uh, um, uh, there are lots of platforms nowadays that are based on adaptive learning. So this has to do with robot robotization and uh, the use of artificial intelligence. There is a creative destruction of jobs Taxi drivers are really, uh, uh, they are, uh, there's a threat, right? I mean, uh, Uber is, is um, a threat, has been a threat. But, you know, this is only a phase because with elect electric cars and autonomous cars, you won't need even the Uber driver. Um, so there is going to be an extended life cycle, right? People will be able to work, and we're doing this now. We are dispersed geographically. Uh, you can teach nowadays from any place in the world, and you don't have to teach only Brazilians. You can teach someone in China or in Japan, right? So uh, this is just to give you a, a glimpse of um, maybe of uh, still darkly uh, we can see, but darkly, but this is coming. So change is going to be slow, but it is coming until it isn't slow anymore. Uh, so these are some of the predictions I was mentioning, right? The impacts of just one issue, the impacts of longevity, for example, if we do become to, I mean, especially the young people that are uh, being born now, if they live to be 120 years, or even some of us, uh, you know, retirement will happen after we're 100. Uh, adolescence will actually be a period that goes uh, uh, up to uh, when you're 40 years old. You will be, I mean, this is also, this is already a, a reality for some women, right? Uh, so, uh, of course, if people are going to live much, uh, to, to, I mean, to be 100, uh, we'll have to reform pension funds. And this is already happening. And we're not even living uh, to be 100 right now, but we've had uh, changes in, in the laws of our pension fund in Brazil, right? And every country is doing that too. So that, there, there's going to be, a, as you can see, without having, I'm not a specialist, I'm not a scientist studying these things, but I don't think we need external proof. I mean, in, in, in terms of scientific proof, this is happening. We, we are witnessing this. Okay, so what has this um, uh, got to do with education? Well, this is also happening and you already see this, right? The use of gamification. How, how well versed are you in gamification? How well versed are you in, digital, in the digital classroom? How, um, uh, how have you been preparing yourself for a more technological education. I'm not saying you stop studying English, stop getting your certificates. No, no, 
I'm saying we have to do a little bit more. And this, you have the years here, and there's they are predicting that by 2050, there's going to be hybrid intelligence. That means they will insert a chip and you will have, uh, you can actually, you will be able to store vocabulary and information for your brain to access it immediately. So maybe vocabulary teaching is not something that we have to worry about anymore. Um, but who is going to develop that uh, kind of, of chip? Who is going to develop the information that is still needed, right? Uh, that's why I think, and who is going to, uh, especially the young kids, right? Uh, when they're, I'm talking about uh, early childhood education and especially uh, elementary uh, school, uh, will still need teachers. Uh, and this is not going to be something that we're sure that everyone is going to have access to. It's not like, uh, even when we think, oh, okay, there, there, there are going to be flights to the moon, there are going to be flights to Mars, but is everyone going to be able to afford it? So it's not tragedy, okay? It's not, I'm, I'm not trying to depict a tra tragic scenario, but are we being prepared for this? Or more than that, are we preparing ourselves for all this? Well, the other books that have influenced me as a professional were these three. We, we, we can't stop uh, these changes but we can um, prepare ourselves so that we become innovators. So I, I read these three books, um, um, Clayton Christensen, also from MIT, uh, he died recently, but you know, and this, uh, there is another one that I didn't include here, uh, also by Clayton Christensen, and it's called Disrupting Class. And he wrote about education. And in fact, there are books, I'm still reading them, about systems thinking in education. So maybe this is going to be another, maybe another opportunity for us to meet again when I finish my readings and have time to reflect and maybe uh, to share more food for thought uh, on another occasion. And all this, for us to be innovative, we have to consider the person. So in marketing, people talk about customer centricity. We have a customer. I know that some teachers hate when we talk about students as customers. But, you know, uh, we don't have to see the customer only as uh, someone who provides money to us. It's someone we serve. And I think as teachers, we serve people. How, and I think in my case, for example, maybe some of you, We've been taught to be teachers who would think of not a complex system. We were uh, taught to be teachers in a very stable system, right? So we, we were taught to teach not what the student needed many times, but what we thought was necessary for him or her to learn. We're in an age or at an age of interdependence we have to listen to our customer. Here are a few examples. Can you uh, recognize uh, this mission? This is a mission from a very big company. Our vision is to be Earth's most customer-centric company, to build a place where people can come to find and discover anything they might want to buy online. This is Amazon. We can't say that they are not successful, but they are not successful because they have millions of products. They're successful because they're actually delivering what people want. This one, I'm sure you know, we, and this is part of their mission, we create happiness by providing, so we create happiness by providing the finest in entertainment for people of all ages, everywhere. So you see, it's a very important thing in human life, happiness, the finest in entertainment, people of all ages and everywhere. Isn't this customer centricity? Well, in customer the customer centricity theory, 
mentions that there are three stages for us to be um, uh, customer centric. Uh, it has to do with the customer experience and our uh, ability to provide what uh, the, uh, uh, the customer needs. So if we just meet his needs, his or her needs, we're at a very basic level of customer centricity. Okay, someone comes to us and says, I need to learn English and you start teaching English. Does that mean that you're, I mean, the initial needs is there, uh, uh, the initial need is there. I want to learn English, you're giving English classes. But are you actually um, uh, giving them um, those English classes in, a, in an easy way that they can see their progress, that they can understand the step-by-step? -step. And are you adapting and adjusting to provide this easy way? And by easy, I don't mean that they don't have to make an effort. I, I mean that they're, they're, they, are, they see the um, easy part of their learning when they actually see their progress, when you scaffold their progress for them. And the customer experience is enjoyable when, of course, they get more than they were expecting. They actually get more than they were, th 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 they, uh, more than they thought it would be possible. Are you going the extra mile for your students? So it is service. Also in marketing, in, in, at least in this age of interdependence, you know, uh, they say that the formula for success when we think of market proactivity, so are we being proactive? Because that's one of the main um, um, attitudes in complex systems. If you see the whole and if you see the parts, you have to be proactive to be innovative. So market proactivity is composed of some elements, proactive strategies, proactive marketing. So you have to show that you are, um, you, sh you, you have to show that you have things that are desirable, um, uh, that people want from you as a teacher. You have to be innovative, but there's this, the market, market proactivity does not happen without people. Look, all of this is adding. This is being multiplied. People multiply the results. Are we looking at methods and um, uh, technology? Remember, technology is a means only. Uh, the book was technology. When we simply take the book from the paper uh, shape or format, and we put it into a digital format, are we changing anything really? Well, what's the wow factor you are creating for yourself and for your students? You have to start looking at systems and you have to employ systems thinking. You have to look at the parts and the uh, whole. Never forget the whole because the whole is healthy. Almost uh, coming to the end of this presentation, I would like to uh, show you this video, which may uh, some of you or maybe many of you have already seen. But I think the message is very, very important. The future of education can't be found in a gadget or an app or a program or a product. It doesn't require a think tank full of pundits. No, the future of education can be found in your classroom. Your classroom is packed with creative potential. You have all the innovation you need right there in your room. And you have the power to make it happen. It's what happens when you experiment. It's what happens when you give your students voice and choice. It's what happens when you abandon the scripted curriculum and take your students off road in their learning. It's what happens when you teach to your students rather than teaching to the test. It's what happens when you unleash the creative power of all of your students. When you make the bold decision to let them make things and design things and solve problems that they find relevant 
Sometimes it's messy and even confusing. It often looks humble. But understand this, that every time your students get the chance to be authors or filmmakers or scientists or artists or engineers, you are planting the seeds for a future that you could never have imagined on your own. That's the power of innovative teachers. That is why the future of education is you. Well, so we come to crossroads again. <laughs> yeah, because that means that maybe all that we have been prepared for, all that we have been doing so far, we don't have to throw that away, but we have to look at the possibilities of adapting all that into a new scenario. Crossroads again, decisions again, right? But that's the point. You are a well of possibilities. Teachers have this. Uh, if, if you decided to be a teacher, it's because you believed in possibilities. You probably, in your dictionary, the only, the only word of two that I will mention, the only word that is there in your dictionary is possible. The word impossible does not exist in, in a teacher's dictionary because we don't accept impossibility. We accept negotiation. We accept adaptation. We, we accept, um, uh, we, we don't necessarily strive for perfection, but we, we strive for quality and quality many times doesn't have to be perfect. So you are the possibility of the future. So the, the theme of this webinar or of these webinars that um, uh, the chapter uh, in Hondonia is proposing uh, is exactly that, a world of possibilities through us. And I, like, I would like to almost finish by citing, I'm a, um, an English literature uh, teacher at the university and maybe you already know this um, poem by Robert Frost. It's about the two roads and having to make a choice. And there's always two roads or at least two. And then one, a, a small part of the poem says, two roads diverged in a wood. And I took the one less traveled by. And that has made all the difference. And by choosing sometimes the less traveled road, this last traveled road is the, the, the road of systems thinking that I'm proposing, the road of thinking and considering your student as a person, but as your customer, as someone who you are serving um, and your being of service. But for you to be of service, you have to consider him or her. Good ideas, so technology, PBL, task-based learning, all that. Good ideas without action usually become re regrets. Technology is a good example of that. It's only a good idea if you don't put it into practice in a, in a way that is going to meet the needs of your students. It's only a good idea. But in the end, it will just be a regret if you don't use it thinking of how technology um, fits the system. I think someone who knows a lot about or knew a lot about connectivity, um, you know, I like, I like his words. This is Steve job, Jobs, I mean. Your work is going to fill a large part of your life. And the only way to be truly satisfied is to do what you believe is great work. And being a teacher is to do great work. And the only way to do great work is to love what you do. If you haven't found it yet, keep looking. Don't settle. As with all matters of the heart, you'll know when you find it. 
And to actually finish, teaching is not a delivery system. It's an art form. It's a sentence, it's a quote from Ken Robinson who also died recently. We're all artists. I wasn't born just to teach or to just teach. I was born to inspire others, to help them change and learn to never give up, even when faced with challenges that seem impossible. This I here is not me. I hope you are repeating that to yourself. This is another book by Clayton Christensen, How Will You Measure Your Life? When you reach the age of 80, 90, or maybe 120, how will you measure your life? This talk is dedicated to the courageous people who do the work that matters and who do the work to matter. Thank you for your very precious time. I hope we can meet again sometime soon. Thank you very much, Professor Isa. We love your talk. And we have here one question. Let me ask you. It's from Alexandre. And he asks, do you think traditional uh, class will finish and flipped classroom will be a new way? Alexandre, that's a very good question. You know, uh, we're all trying to find this pandemic brought us to a standstill in many, in many um, uh, aspects. I, I think what, what we'll have to do is maybe reflect exactly on what um, the, on the styles, the learner styles involved. Uh, there will be people who will be very successful with the flipped classroom uh, model. There will be students who will work very well with the traditional model. For example, if, if it, I, I see that with my private students, I have engineers, maybe my age, they, you know, they, they like the traditional, the traditional kind of class, even if it's online. They like, they like to listen to me more than they would like to speak or they would like to speak, but they, they, want, the, they want to be corrected, for example. Uh, they don't want to experiment. Uh, they don't want to make mistakes. They, so older people, right? If, if they're younger people, no problem. They want to talk. They don't want to be interrupted all the time. They, so I think, uh, but the answer to your question is the traditional way of teaching won't be the only one from now on. And that's, that's where we have to start. Uh, I think we've all been doing that, right? We've all, I've been, I had to learn how to use Zoom today. I had, I had a, a, a hint from a, one of the colleagues here. Uh, we're all learning from each other. Uh, but one thing for sure is the traditional way of teaching is not the only one, won't be the only one, and we'll have to know how to deal with different ways of teaching. Uh, I don't believe that the flipped classroom is the only possible way. Um, some schools uh, are trying to do that because they discovered that this can be um, profitable. They will maybe you know, pay half of the time only. Students will do a lot on their own and then they won't... So if they have three hours of classes, they will do one hour and a half on their own. And uh, then they will have only a live class or a face-to-face -face class only one hour and a half. And they will pay only one hour and a half, I mean, to the teacher. But uh, I mean, these arrangements are, are not thinking of education. They're thinking of uh, uh, profit, uh, right? So, but I, 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 your question is very, um, uh, I think very contemporary. Uh, what we'll have to be uh, ready for is something that uh, we'll have to have more varieties, more varieties in terms of how we teach. That's true. So I said, I'd like to thank you again. Our time is, <laughs> is close to the end. 
So thank you very much. You talked about connectivity and now we are connected. Uh, I'm, I was in, in South and I'm in North and we, now we are connected. You see how technology is amazing. You see, I have a, I have a relative there in Hondonia. Maybe, uh, I mean, it will be a good opportunity to visit her and you. That's true. <laughs> so thank you very much again. And now we are going to go to our second uh, speaker. Thank you very much. Thank Elsa. you. Bye bye. Bye bye. So now we are going to to start with our second. One minute. So now you are the host, Adriana. Okay. Um, sorry about the noise, <laughs> my doors. <laughs> no problem. So while they they are coming, so um I'll talk about our second um, speaker. So our second speaker is Jan Krutzina. So Leidy, hello. Hello, hello Renata. Hello everyone. My name is Leidy, I am uh, Secretary at Prestiso Rondona Chapter. And now um, I'm going to introduce Professor Ian Krutzina, who is our second speak, speaker at this meeting. He's going to talk about WhatsApp for teachers, practical lessons from the Brazilian English Olympics. And who is Ian Krutzina? Ian Krutzina is the founder of Chat Class, an educational technology startup with the mission to transform education through chat and artificial intelligence. Professor Krutzina, thank you for, for accepting our invitation today. It's an honor for us in Rondonia and all over the world. <laughs> Please, the floor is yours, Professor Ian. Please. Hello. Hi there. Hi. Let me just fix my name here. You're welcome here. Thank you very Did much. I did I uh, did I say your name rightly? Yes. Ian. Ian, Ian Aso. Um, it's a difficult name for many people, so you did yes. very well. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm gonna jump into my presentation, and then we can have probably plenty of time to have more. Um, more um, Q and A and and conversation at the end of the session. Okay. Yes, we will. At the end of the session, we are gonna have some questions. I hope so. Okay. Wonderful. Let me do this. Give the screen share here quickly. Uh, screen share. Share screen. Okay. Okay, you can see my screen? Yes, it is. Everything Clear. is okay. Okay, let's go. So first of all, thank you for the opportunity to speak here to, to at your event and to the members. Um, I, I am um, 
going to talk a little bit about our work here in Brazil on the English Olympics and especially what it means to be a teacher today in the in the age of technology and uh, especially in, in the pandemic situation where technology becomes even more important. Um, so first of all, I will explain how a German guy here talks about English in Brazil, how I ended up in this position. Then I would like to talk a bit more about how being an English teacher means using technology and specifically give some updates on the English Olympiad that we recently completed and talk about the technology we used and how it can be helpful for English teachers in Brazil in general. First of all, my name is Jan, as you said. Uh, I'm not a teacher, actually. Um, English is not my first language. I'm just an English student, really. Uh, but I have expertise in technology and I looked at, I'm looking at how as a student I can learn better and in the process of that we discovered many, many, uh, many tools that teachers can use. But I'm actually here to speak to you uh, less than as a teacher but more as a, as a technologist. My background, where do I come from? Uh, I grew up in a small town in Germany. My public, I went to public high school. My dad is a public school teacher. Uh, my school is very old. It was founded 500 years ago almost. I grew up in the countryside. In Portuguese, I would say, eu sou da Rosa, da Alemanha. Um, and uh, I'm a, just from a simple family of teachers, but I ended up getting a scholarship. So I studied at Harvard University, computer science and also did an, an MBA, a postgraduate program at Harvard later. Uh, I came to Brazil uh, really out of curiosity because growing up in Germany, we always think Brazil is a very cool place, so to speak. So uh, I came to Brazil to um, uh, basically uh, to work in, uh, I worked in technology here, I worked in games, uh, and in that process, I discovered that many people in Brazil are looking to learn English, but most people don't speak English. So I discovered this big opportunity that we're here with all, all of your work trying to address. Uh, I took Portuguese at Harvard, so I learned Portuguese in English as my third language. And it was very, um, very, I think, very different than the way... Um, I learned English in Germany and English in Germany, I learned in the classroom setting for eight years with traditional methods, very, very slow. And I wasn't very uh, good at English when I left my high school, but Portuguese in one semester at college at Harvard, I forced myself to speak a lot and get more confidence in it. So um, after one semester, I had the basics and then I went to an internship to Brazil, to Bahia and improved my Portuguese for speaking basically with everybody I could find. So um, that sort of informed also our work here that we're doing. Uh, Germany is not much bigger than Hondonia. Uh, I, have, um, I have a great admiration for the, the size and the diversity of Brazil. Um, Brazil is much bigger, it's 25 times bigger than Germany. Uh, but um, Hondonia and Germany are sort of in the same category. Of course, Germany has a lot more people, 80 million people, and Hondonia maybe 1.7. I met some friends from Hondonia already. Uh, we went to an event from the U.S. Embassy um, last year, and uh, we worked on a hackathon together, so I, I had some exposure already, and that's why I'm here today as well. Um, what I discovered in my work in Brazil is, is learning English um, for Brazilians is a big, it's a big challenge, especially the speaking part. I found that people were very shy to speak to me in English. So um, when I just, when I looked more at this problem, I, I thought people, I discovered people are afraid of making mistakes. So while in general, um, Brazil tends to be a more outgoing culture, uh, I found that um, on my in my interactions that the speaking of English is a big block. And so I, I was trying to think about how we can address this speaking challenge. Because obviously learning English means for most people, 
conversing in English, speaking English, how to, how to achieve that, how to overcome this shyness and this, um, this fear of making mistakes. Like if I speak Portuguese, when I speak Portuguese, I make many mistakes, but I just speak. So speaking is actually a very hard challenge to learn in the classroom. This is a scientific study from Germany that found that in an average ninth grade classroom, people only speak about 4% of the time of the classroom time. Most time is spent by the teacher lecturing or the students doing some form of exercising. But in 4% of the class time, they are speaking in full sentences of English. And that only adds up to about five minutes per student per year. What it means is that um, with the traditional classroom learning, even in a, in a good methodology, generally, the speaking time is very low because it's not enough time for all students to speak and they cannot overcome their shyness to speak. On the other hand, what we see here in Brazil is that there's lots of smartphones, more smartphones than people, many more smartphones and TVs. Every smartphone has WhatsApp, 99% have WhatsApp. And so using the messaging on the, on the chat, the audio messaging on WhatsApp, to me was like a, a great approach for practicing speaking. So um, it's a technology that is everybody can use. It's very simple to use. It works almost in every corner of Brazil. And it is, um, it's very powerful because it makes you produce the language in, uh, in spoken format. And that is something that usually students don't have much opportunity to do. So our focus was on developing what we call chat-based learning. How to use the, our habit, our human habit to use WhatsApp and to chat for the, the purpose of learning English. And as it turns out, especially nowadays, recently with the pandemic, we saw that already over 80% of Brazilian teachers actually use WhatsApp for teaching and interacting with their students. So we have an opportunity here to take this very powerful technology that everybody has in their hand and make it useful for English learning and especially for speaking. So we built a chatbot for practicing English. It's basically a tool inside of WhatsApp you just connect to a phone number on WhatsApp and you use that. And it allows you to use audio messaging, for example, to send messages and get feedback on them. We, we build it so we have a system for teachers and for students. Um, so we can both assist the teacher with the teaching process as well as the student with the learning process. Um, and, and so um, we're basically using very advanced technology from Silicon Valley behind the scene, but on the front, you just have a simple WhatsApp. So that way we, we believe we can dramatically improve the, um, the learning impact for, for all Brazilian English learners, not just for those in elite programs. So we are looking here as a tool to use technology to democratize the access to learning English and also speaking English. That's sort of been my work here uh, for now. Um, and for me, what it, what it means to be a teacher then is basically to leverage technology, uh, which is very important even, to, even more today. And, um, and engaging students. Students are at home uh, with little orientation without the in-class experience. So um, the engagement of students today is, is very critical. Um, and also, for teachers, it's a big challenge just in terms of coping with all this new reality and the stress. So resilience is something also we need to be aware of that teachers maintain, uh, oops, let's go for, oh, nice, okay. All right. Um, so uh, yes, so basically meaning, being a teacher today means leveraging te technology in a way that is inclusive and engages students. Technology in, the, in this year with the pandemic has become a, a something that can also divide people further. Some people have access, other people don't have access. So uh, our view, my view here on technology is that it has to be inclusive and democratizing. So we need to use technology that's simple, 
and that works everywhere. We cannot use advanced tools and, and fancy platforms if most of the students don't use them, if most of the teachers don't know how to use them, if the students don't install them, if the internet connectivity where the students live doesn't support them. All of these things have to be considered when we think about the, the digitalization of English learning. And I, I, I found that using like a platform like WhatsApp is tremendously, um, tremendously democratic because it's really the thing that everybody more or less knows how to use and everybody uses. And that's been sort of our, our focus. So with that, we started this year, like in October, we ran the English Olympics for Brazil, the English Olympiad uh, 2020. It's a cultural contest, like a concurso cultural uh, for Encino Medio and Encino Fundamental Dois. It ran in the month of uh, October and it was completely online. So basically students and teachers would set up to enroll in this and participate just using essentially WhatsApp. Um, and we organized this as a, as an open project for everybody to participate. It was um, without um, cost to anybody. And we worked together with the US embassy, the, um, the regional, uh, the, the RELO, basically the RELO office uh, worked with us on, on this project. And I wanna share with you now a couple of insights and data that we gathered in this process. So first of all, it was successful in terms of reaching every corner of Brazil. We had students from the interior to interior. We had people from the peripherias and from the capitais. We had people from everywhere. Nearly 140,000 students participated in this month and almost 5,000 teachers. So that was a very great participation. Um, and people completed millions of activities and spoke millions of words. This is what's particularly important to me. People, have, people are speaking English during the Olympics. Uh, they don't typically speak when they are in the classroom, unfortunately. They certainly don't speak when they're sitting at home um, doing some remote work. So giving people a chance to speak English on WhatsApp um, and practice that speaking competency is something that we, we are very, um, very proud of because I think it is basically a game changer for teaching of English. Uh, our participation was very wide across Brazil, but we had a few, uh, we had a strong concentration in the Northeast, Sierra, Pernambuco, Bahia. Uh, Sao Paulo, just because of its size, also was a big, a big participant. So we had, uh, like I said, participation from everywhere. We had about 1,500 students, I think, from Hondonia. And um, we had people from every corner of the country, every area code, everything. Teachers participated largely because they saw the Olympiad as a way for students to learn more English in a, in a new way. They wanted to try something new and they also love to use technology. So this project helped everybody come together around do something new to, do, to learn English with te technology. This was our, our hope and it turned out to be correct. Uh, Hondonia had three, uh, three top teachers of Hondonia are Ahakeo, Alisi, and Monica. So thank you, thank you three for your great participation and inspiring, inspiring the rest of the community. We also had uh, lovely students uh, here from Hondonia that are, that are basically the top participants from, from the state. Now looking at some insights, what we learned by performing this project in the last month and also what we heard from the participants in terms of feedback and participation. Um, we had, uh, first of all, the Olympiad for us, the tool uh, for autonomous learning, because it is not depending on uh, the participation, it was not depending on a, a fixed classroom setting or like a, a formal system. It was very flexible for students by themselves when they have time, where they are to study and to practice English. And for teachers as well to follow the students progress in a way that's uh, very, um, um, very simple and very uh, sort of um, uh, easy to do. Teachers 
told us in the in our research of the participants that they're actually quite comfortable using technology. Um, we have um, here in a survey we, we saw that basically over I would say over over seventy percent of the participants are in the high range of uh, comfort with technology. That's a great sign. So teachers are really uh, ready to to leverage technology today. Um, many of them have received uh, digital training. The vast majority have been trained for digital technology, and that's also great progress. Uh, streaming digital content is something very widely adopted. Of course, YouTube is very, very common, but also Netflix. So we, we can see that uh, bringing in more English um, to to listen and to experience uh, is also something that's, that, that's been done a lot with the English teachers in Brazil, as well as audio content. Music obviously makes a lot of sense, uh, but also podcasts and, uh, and radio has been used in the, in the classroom quite a bit. Social media for teaching is still, a, um, is still an opportunity. I mean, 60% of teachers not, uh, do, not, do not use social media. We use a lot Instagram and WhatsApp. We're also experimenting with TikTok and Facebook. So uh, we have definitely a, uh, a rich experience base to share with everybody here who, who's interested. But I think um, it's already uh, a common, 40% is already a fairly common um, phenomenon that people are actually uh, using social media for teaching. So now I want to talk a little bit more about how do we make this, how do we how do we make it work? Like what's behind this, the solution of using WhatsApp for teaching? It's, what is a chatbot? We are using a chat class, which is our product, which is a chatbot on WhatsApp. How does this work? It's basically a little mini app inside of WhatsApp. So you don't need to install any other app. app. You can just run it within your WhatsApp account without any changes. That is a very simple way of using technology today. Uh, our mission initially was to create this tool to help democratizing the access to quality English learning so that we can not just serve the elite of students, but also those without access. Um, and using, um, using uh, a technology to basically broaden the access to the opportunity to speak English and to practice English in in a in a much in a much uh, in a way that is not exclusive but lets everybody participate. That was sort of our mission. Um, as a tool, chat class is a tool that helps teachers use WhatsApp for teaching. So within it, we have uh, lots of activities um, aligned for the BNCC and the different grade levels. Um, these activities students can do when they have time and when they want, and, the teach and they are corrected automatically. So the teacher will receive feedback um, on the student's progress and on the student's responses. This is uh, helpful in order to engage students because they have something immediate. They can do something, get immediate interactive feedback. Um, and it's good for this teacher because we are not, we're, we're trying to align the content is aligned with the BNCC um, requirements. So it's easier for the teacher to sort of like um, uh, have students uh, practice here with us, as opposed to having to, um, you know, reconcile their book with any sort of online platform. So that's sort of the platform that we created. Um, chat technology in my, my experience can help making education more accessible especially using WhatsApp. As we, as we mentioned, WhatsApp is on every smartphone in Brazil, pretty much. Um, correcting activities automatically and um, monitoring student progress uh, for teachers is something that helps uh, just with the sheer volume of work that teachers typically have. We have had some teachers that have 20 tomas or, or 25 tomas with up to 40 students. So, at this amount of work that teachers have, um, bringing technology to automate and provide automated feedback is something definitely um, um, that, that, that helps um, those teachers in our experience. And, and finally, bringing the speaking aspect to the practice 
because um, we don't have um, many opportunities to do any sort of interactive activities for speaking today. So as technology evolves, uh, we are working on the use of artificial intelligence for teaching. And here you have basically this division of labor between teachers that perform certain tasks uh, and technology that can perform other tasks. The two things are a division of labor. It's, I don't see that technology can take over the teacher's role really, but it can help a lot. For example, instant feedback. Um, when you have 400 students trying to practice their speaking, a teacher cannot humanly work with them and give them feedback. But we, in fact, can do that using technology very easily. Um, on the other hand, uh, a teacher is uniquely capable of having a one-on-one -on -one com com conversation with a student to help with the problems of the students, the motivation of the students. Human empathy is something that technology can obviously never provide. Um, and what technology can do is collect and analyze data. So teachers can get better insights in the students' problems and students get better insights about themselves. What are their challenges? So uh, based on those analysis that the technology can do, it can furthermore deliver personalized content. So if we know a student has problems with certain areas, the technology can help in that particular area and deliver the student more exercises for that area, for example. And it can generally inform the teacher um, for, uh, it can inform the teacher about the student's um, main challenges. So a teacher has so much, so many students, so many classes, technology can help focus the attention on the biggest problems, the biggest challenges. So that's sort of like a part of our sort of division of labor. And that's why I don't believe that technology is in a, in a sense replacing teachers. It is something that uh, augments and helps the teacher. Here's a study from China, a famous Chinese education technology expert, Dr. Kai Fu Li. And he shared this interesting chart that shows different professions, different jobs, for example, truck driver or teacher, scientist, various jobs and how they map against the degree of compassion and the need for, let's say, creativity versus just like optimization of processes. So what he identifies here is that some jobs like a truck driver do not need human compassion. You just have to drive the, the machine and it has to be optimized. So you need to drive it efficiently, like the right speed and so on. Like this is like a, a typical job that technology can replace and probably will replace in the, in the medium to long term. Um, on the other hand, a teacher is somebody that needs a lot of compassion, a lot of human compassion, and lots of creativity and strategic planning, something that technology cannot do very well at all. So I think these jobs over here are very, are very far from being replaced by the little robot. The robot may replace some of these guys over here, but teachers are um, people that have a role for the long term because of their human empathy and human motivation that students need. So again, there's a natural division of labor between technology and teachers. And technology can help and provide big help for teachers. Um, we know today in the English classroom, we have many challenges. Um, we, have, um, we have little communication practice due to the fact that there's too many students per teacher and too few hours in the classroom, in most classrooms, of course, some of the more advanced bilingual programs have addressed this problem already. But for the vast majority of Brazil, that is not the reality. So how can we, there's a problem of the communication practice. Now, technology can be a chat partner, so we can actually practice with a robot. This can be something where technology can help address a very big challenge that we have today. Um, Limited personal feedback. Again, it's very hard for a teacher in, in current schools to give lots of personal feedback for, for individual students. But with the technology, this can be done. Content today, in most scenarios, is fairly static. It's a one size fits all. 
everybody has the same book, everybody looks at the same blackboard, people have the same content. With technology, this can be more personalized and, and, and handled in a more adaptive way. Uh, classrooms in, in English are very heterogeneous. Uh, people have different levels and different interests. And this is extreme, it's nearly impossible for like a human teacher to, to deal with that kind of diversity. However, with technology and individualized learning, this can be done. Finally, um, tutoring and additional um, reinforcement of English uh, practice outside of the traditional classroom is very limited today. But with um, technology and in the future with, with robots, they can actually perform explanations as well. So we can analyze students' weaknesses and afterwards, um, afterwards uh, explain um, exactly what the challenges are and how to overcome them. So I think that's already the end of my uh, official presentation here. Um, I would like to see if we can engage with the audience a bit and figure out what else technology can do, what are the experiences of our participants here, and how I and we as technology people can actually help teachers in this new context even more. I don't know, uh, Leiji, how, how can you, um, can we post some questions? Uh, is there like a chat here we can use? Should I? Questions? I don't have any questions so far. Maybe, uh, maybe mm, if we give a little more time for them to make no questions. Problem. Okay. It's a pity it is at the end of your presentation. So while we don't have questions specifically, you can continue talk, talking about these questions. Maybe it's better for us to, okay. to understand better. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, it's a question of, um, if you're looking at, like, what I'm excited about is to... Um, elevate English across all corners of Brazil. Um, you have a lot of work done in the, in the top schools and the top private schools and, uh, and then some interesting sort of projects in, in, in the public sector as well. But what sort of my main mission and passion is to see how to, how to scale this up, you know, how to bring it to every corner of the country. And for that, I... I'm looking to, I'm looking for collaborators and input, you know, I'm looking for people in Hondonia to, to talk to us, talk to me, and we can maybe solve together some, some of the challenges they have there, you know. Um, I think that's sort of my, my, main, my main interest. Ian, well, just one thing. Here in Hondonia, there is a group of teachers, including Monica, Raquel and Alice, mm -hmm. and me as well. And we, we are trying to, um, we are trying to more motivate much more the students and teachers to participate next year in 2021, to participate uh, at the chat class, and also at the Olympiad. So what suggestion can you give us in order to improve this uh, fight for a, a better teaching English in Rondonia? Yeah, I think <clears throat> for my... Um... My experience with technology, I would say um, it's interesting to give the students a motivation to learn English. You need to think about that. So um, we actually uh, had a theme for this year's Olympics. Um, we were looking at the future of work. And so we had a number of um, testimonies. We, we recorded videos from Brazilians living in other countries. 
and they're telling us about how um, how English has transformed their lives. And it's a wide variety of people, but people including from very limited backgrounds. Um, and they, to a series of steps and programs, became good at English. And with English, they had access to scholarships to study abroad, or work abroad, or work in international settings here in Brazil. So I think what we, one of the big challenges is to make English relevant for the student in the interior of Brazil uh, that probably many of which from more humble backgrounds don't often have the confidence or they don't feel it's necessary for them. You know, it's not, it's another world, this whole world of, of English and so on. And so, I mean, when I grew up like that, it was as well, I grew up in a very limited horizon. I had a small town background. So I think we need to focus on first on showing why English is relevant to the kids. That is, um, something where technology can help a lot. We can use media. Uh, we have little videos, we have Instagram, we have even TikToks, we have many things to inspire the students to care about English. That's one thing. And then once those that do care, uh, we wanna make it basically simple and easy to get into it, get into the practice. So overcoming the speaking hurdle, for example. Um, I think that's sort of like, I think we need to think about like next year as like a year long effort to first inspire people to give English, uh, to understand why English might be relevant for them and what opportunity it can bring to them. And then also help them learn better and help the teachers uh, in the teaching process as well. Now I saw two questions here from the chat. Let yeah, me I, I, I would say, um, I would ask the, the, those two questions here. And okay. the first one it is, hmm, what is the biggest challenge to find in a way to provide artificial intelligence in education in Brazil? Right. Um, thank you for the question, uh, Alexander, I think. Um, when you look at education in Brazil, you don't necessarily see a lot of artificial intelligence. You don't associate those two things easily. Uh, so you could say there's a huge challenge. You know, AI is so advanced from Silicon Valley and we're here in the realities of, of, uh, of public school and so on. It's a very big gap. So it seems, but I actually don't think so. First of all, we can look at China. I think we all must look to China for the future of education. China is extremely aggressive in developing education. They're producing huge amounts of talented people. And it's almost like a reinforcing self-fulfilling prophecy cycle. China produces millions of engineers for technology every year. And those engineers then work more into improving the technology for teaching. So it's actually an amazing, amazing uh, case study to look at. Brazil is a different reality. But today, if you look at a school in Brazil, a public school in the middle of Hondonia, you don't see probably a lot of AI at first. But when you look at the people who are in the school building, the teachers and the students, these are Brazilian consumers. Most of them have smartphones. Many of them have smartphones or they share a smartphone with the community, with the family or, or so on. On the smartphone, there's many apps, Instagram probably, probably TikTok. Maybe WhatsApp, probably WhatsApp. But TikTok, Instagram are extremely strongly driven by artificial intelligence. The content you see is all artificial intelligence. So every day, Brazilians in Hondonia, wherever, are using AI a lot today. Netflix has a lot of AI. Every, you know, every big digital service we use today has a lot of AI. So to bring it to education doesn't look like such a huge jump, you know? Um, I think today um, the challenge is not that big really, because given that most people in Brazilian schools have already access to a smartphone and WhatsApp and some other apps, via those channels, you can reach them already and you connect AI to that. And we did it very simple using just uh, speech tools, you know, speech analysis for spoken English. It's a, it's, 
It's quite simple, actually. Um, it's a very sophisticated technology, but it's as simple as recording an audio message on WhatsApp. So I do think that um, the challenge is solvable. There is no big challenge. We just need to take what's already there. Like, I don't think you're going to bring some advanced technology system in the school, you install, you know, whatever, iPads and fiber optics and all these things. This will not happen in the, anytime soon. But if we can use the phones, the little, as I say, shingalings that they already have in their hands, in their pockets, let's use them for what can be done today. You know, that's sort of my view. It, it can be done today. Like we should not wait. It is ready to use now. So we just need to organize ourselves, identify mm -hmm. what are the needs and attack them. It is completely possible today. Well, I believe so in what you are pointing. But Ian, I have, I think it is a general question because it is not specifically here in Rondonia, but uh, in general, Anani is asking, do you believe that technology can change the way that we teach? I certainly do. Indeed, yes. Um, I think today, you all are already using technology every day, every minute, right now, you know, we're using it so much. So I think the question is, how do we make it best, you know, how, and again, my point about simplicity, using the simple technologies that really work, and use them in the best possible way for pedagogical goals, and not and not too much worry about the the fa the fanciest thing of things. You know, I think we can use very simple things. For example, WhatsApp groups, just mm -hmm. a simple WhatsApp group. You know, people can record an audio. They can give each other feedback. It's that simple. It can be done today. You know, people are doing it. I think what I saw in the Olympics, having over 5,000 teachers respond to us, is that there are many that in those 5,000 there are many teachers. There are some teachers who have amazing creativity. So if we can use a forum like the Brass Tesol and other organizations to share those best practices, I think that's something very, um, very powerful. Um, the, the simple ways of using technology, obviously teachers today have many Facebook groups, many WhatsApp groups. We're already doing that in many ways. Uh, we're doing it as well with chat class, but I think the opportunity is clearly there that we can leverage simple best practices of using technology, using simple technologies to achieve great impact in teaching. And I would certainly be very happy to help and work with any of you in developing new ideas on top of that. You know, if there's something that you wish you could do with the WhatsApp or with something else, I would love to be your, your thought partner for that. Thank you. Thank you for your help. I, I know we're gonna keep in contact and we need you and all, of, all the people from the chat class. Uh, well, I just um, was, well, a person here asked a question in Portuguese. Okay. And I know that you speak Portuguese, right? Uh, uh, do you prefer to speak in Portuguese or as the question was? Portuguese. Or in English? I'm going to... Faz em português. Ok. Vou ler a pergunta, ok? Por favor. Por favor. Seu português está muito bom. Ainda não. Você vai descobrir muitos erros logo. <laughs> Just a minute. Uh, sim. Tem aqui Mitzi. Uh -huh. é, eu estou no grupo né, do, do uh, Brush Sister Rondona Chapter e tem aqui a Nani e logo em seguida a Mitzi. Aí a pergunta é, como você vê a educação após a pandemia? Como a tecnologia pode ajudar nesse processo? Uma boa. Vou falar em português? Tá Fique à vontade. Ok. Uh, bom, é, a pandemia, acho que deu um choque no sistema, 
do ensino uh, básico, porque é um sistema, uh, quando eu olho para o Brasil, o sector da educação, e obviamente a maior educação é a educação pública, é, o sector da educação era um dos menos digitalizados de todos. É, na agricultura no Brasil tem muita tecnologia, em qual, qualquer, qualquer canto do Brasil tem muita tecnologia, mas na educação teve sempre pouco, por vários motivos que não precisamos elaborar agora. Mas a pandemia basicamente é, forçou todo mundo é, para se ajustar de, uma, de um dia para o outro, overnight, eu não sei como falar overnight em, em português, estrangeiro. Mas a gente, uh, então, a gente viu muito, muito desespero em como trocar, como virar online. E isso já passou há seis meses agora, sete meses. Mas eu acho que foi, uma certa forma, um, um choque saudável para <risos> para um, inspirar uma criatividade no, na comunidade. E a gente descobriu que é possível fazer as coisas de uma outra forma. Eu acho que eu espero, eu acho também que isso não vai, um, a gente não vai voltar para o status quo antes. A gente vai, agora, eu acho que a gente está aprendendo como usar mais tecnologia e com isso a gente vai um, continuar de uma forma mais do, do estilo blended learning que você já estava discutindo aqui antes. Um, eu acho que, para mim, é, nosso trabalho antes da pandemia sempre era algo de conectar o espaço além da sala de aula com dentro, tipo, o, a, o uso do WhatsApp, dizemos, ele pode acontecer dentro da sala ou fora. Então, para mim, esta é uma, uma solução fluida que tem que conectar, que pode rodar tanto na escola, se for presencial, ou fora da escola. Eu acho que um, foi um choque, talvez, saudável, esperamos que a gente vai recuperar tudo, mas... Uh, do meu ponto de vista, agora é a hora de ser criativo. Eu, eu como empreendedor de tecnologia, para mim isso é uma hora, uma hora ótima. Eu estou super animado porque todo mundo está repensando o jeito que foi feito anteriormente. É uma disrupção, de uma certa forma. No Vale do Silício, usa muito essa palavra, disruption. Uh, the education system has been disrupted overnight. And agora a gente tem que se virar. Eu acho que é difícil, mas a gente tem as ferramentas na mão. Só temos que nos organizar para realmente aproveitar delas. Verdade. Eu gostei da expressão que você usou, choque saudável. Gostei muito. É isso mesmo. <risos> e assim, uma coisa que eu achei interessante, né, que aconteceu comigo, eu acredito, com a maioria dos teachers, dos professores, é que, sem querer, descobrimos capacidades e competência que até então a gente achava que não tinha ou que não sabia, né? Sim. E isso é muito saudável. Isso é muito saudável. É. Então, so, uh, I have a... Just one more question, and now it is in English. Okay. It is from Alexandre. Mm -hmm. What do you think about? Will be artificial intelligence the center of learning instead of the teacher? Uh, it's a great question, uh, Alexandre. Um... Like I said, you know, it's uh, there is a fear of the artificial intelligence. The, the pe people are afraid, or there are concerns, and they're correct. You know, technology will destroy jobs, but it, it is already destroying jobs, right? When you have a fazenda with one big tractor, you don't need uh, 20 workers. You know, it's it is the fact that technology has always been changing the way we work. Um, And I, like I tried to show in the chart, if you go back there for one second, um, you know, some jobs clearly will, technology will dominate. Like for example, washing dishes, you know, a robot can do it better than a human. It just won't be for the better long term. Better than a human, yes. Yes, better and faster and whatever. Even radiologists. <laughs> a radiologist. And cleaner. And cleaner. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Well, Brazil is already very clean, so you guys, are, it's no problem. But radiologists, uh, you know, that's a very highly trained profession. It's a residencia de muitos anos. But it will be probably 
dramatically changed by using AI of visual, visual AI. Yeah, it can read the X-ray much better than a human actually at some point. But again, teachers, um, I think the human will stay in the center because it is a very human process to learn. But technology can help in many points around it. And I think that's what we learning now in the pandemia, how much technology can help us or not. Uh, I go back to my, my favorite topic of speaking English. Speaking used to be, it has to be in person at the same time, real time in the classroom, two people talk. Teacher poses a question, students responds, speaking. Everybody else has to listen, you know, only one person speaks. Um, so it's real time in person. Now with audio messaging on WhatsApp or any chat, it doesn't have to be WhatsApp, with the grava on audio, you record an audio today and I can listen to it tomorrow and we can be in our houses. So we can have a, a, a spoken conversation without the need of being in the same place at the same time. That is technology at its best. And this is pandemic because before you thought you can speak in the classroom, maybe. Now you're at home, what can you do, right? And it's a great way to just uh, think about spoken homework. You know, you could never do spoken homework. You can written, you can do paper. Now you can record an audio and send it to the teacher. teacher. Teacher can listen to it like two days later. So it's it's really, it's a, it's a huge potential. It's a revolution. And again, Portuguese, I speak with many errors, but I'm Kada Jipao. I just speak with my errors and I get better. And I'd like to encourage the Brazilian students to be the same. Just speak with mistakes, just speak, you know, and get over it and start producing fluency versus accuracy, you know, two different goals in learning. But I think we need to get the Brazilian students to get more comfortable with speak. And frankly, also the Brazilian teachers, because when you are an English teacher in the middle of Germany, in a village, who are you going to speak English to? You know, you don't have much chance to practice English speaking either. So we worked with the um, US Embassy on some programs for English teachers as well. I think um, it's a big opportunity to, to think about how teachers can maintain their speaking skills and enhance them. I think a conference like this is great. Um, but it's once a year, you know, when else can we speak more? And that's something to be, technology can help as well. Oh, Ian, I'm so sorry because it is at the end of our, your presentation, which was great. Uh, that contribute a lot for us teachers in Rondonia. And yeah, we are using chat class as a tool to improve the student English or even our teachers uh, English speaking. Uh, I don't have questions anymore. And can you say something? Can you, are you okay to say, to say goodbye? Yes, 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 of course, <laughs> no problem. No, I mean... Um, Sorry for my mistakes in English. Oh, please. <laughs> I'm still learning. Oh, I understand. English and Portuguese are not my first languages either. And I made many mistakes, even in my English here in this presentation, I, I, I detected myself. Um, I've lived in the in the US for many years. I'm I'm a New Yorker. Uh, I studied at a great university, but still I make mistakes almost in every little interaction. As okay, you um, said, you speak in English, no mere mistakes. That's what I'm doing. I'm trying to speak and speak, and then I can reach uh, a, a better level. Exactly. Um, the chat has more things here. What is this? Opa. Okay. Um, we yeah. thank you a lot. People are saying are thank you at the chat box. Um, so. Yeah. No. Let me then. Let me say the official goodbye here. Um, 
Uh, thank, thank you all for the opportunity. Um, it was, um, as I mentioned, I have great uh, friends in Hondonia already. I wanted to visit your, your state uh, because for me it is so incredibly a difference from where, where I come from. You know, I come from a Horsa, the Alemania, but Horsa. the Horsa do Brazil is <laughs> otro nível. Right? <laughs> so, <laughs> eu, gosto, eu, 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 muito gostaria, eu quero muito visitar vocês lá uh, quando esta situação melhora. Um, eu agradeço a todos vocês por este convite aqui. Eu um, acredito realmente que nós podemos colaborar de uma forma produtiva para os alunos. Eu tenho muito empatia com os alunos um, com backgrounds simples, que têm um sonho de descobrir o mundo. Talvez não tenham o, o dinheiro para fazer o intercâmbio, mas a gente pode usar a tecnologia para trazer o intercâmbio para a casa delas. E isso, bem, isso hoje é super possível, a gente só precisa se organizar. E a pandemia deu, um, deu uma, uma porrada em, em, em nós e a gente, a gente está aqui pronto para uh, uh, up our game, como chama em inglês. Uh, dar um próximo nível do nosso jogo. Então, muito obrigado. E estou Nós é que agradecemos. À, estou à disposição muito para todos vocês para qualquer colaboração. Eu agradeço. Thank you. Tchau, tchau. Goodbye. Então, pessoal, olha que legal, né? Tivemos aí uma, uma palestra maravilhosa com, com o Ian, né? Ah, acredito que é muito bom saber, né? Tipo, para quem gosta de usar a tecnologia, é, nós temos aí o Chat Class, que é uma plataforma maravilhosa que dá para a gente usar e que ela não está somente é, disponível durante as Olimpíadas, né? Ela está disponível aí all year long, ok? <laughs> um, so, our next speaker is Liz, Liz Jing, and, uh, ok, let me see. See here. Hi, Liz. <laughs> Hello. Nice to see you again, Diana. <laughs> Yay, nice to see you. So before Liz start, Liz is our third speaker for our afternoon. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about what she's going to talk about and a little bit about her. Uh, also, <laughs> uh, my name is Jana. I am uh, an advisor from Rastiso in Hondon chapter, and I'm very happy to be here with you. Uh, Liz is going to talk about Together While Apart, a social dynamics in the online language classroom. And uh, this presentation will focus on a discussion of how social dynamics in the language learning classroom have shifted with the widespread shift to online instruction during the COVID-19 pandemic. There will be an overview of general trends, highlight on specific types of interactions and activities, and discussions about strategies to work with the new model of online learning by seizing upon its advantages rather than being hampered by the potential restrictions it presents. Participants, so you all from YouTube will have the opportunity to reflect upon and share your experiences of community connections with your learners during this challenging time, right? Uh, Liz, Liz Jing, she's a language educator from Boston, Massachusetts in the US with 11 years of experience working in higher education and community education settings. 
She also earned a master's degree in applied linguistics from the University of Massachusetts, Boston, with a focus on foreign language pedagogy. Her areas of interest include the role of emotion in language learning, teacher cognition, and teacher education preparation. Her overseas experience includes projects in Belize, Egypt, and Brazil, as well as most recently working as a virtual English language fellow with the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs and with real office. In her current project with the Universidade de Caxias do Sul in Brazil is focused on language teacher education and providing support for new and ongoing English language learning programs at the Universidade de Caxias do Sul. She is also an English language teacher at the Cambridge Center for Adult Education in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So it's an honor, Liz, to have you here. And uh, the screen is yours. You're mute now. So you, okay? Okay, all right. Well, thank you so much, Deanna, for that very kind introduction. Um, I just wanted to say briefly thank you guys for the invitation. Thank you to the Braz Tisol Hondonia chapter. Uh, I'm delighted to be with you all in this way uh, from so far away yet together, which kind of goes with the theme of the talk today. Um, so the other thing I wanted to say guys um, is that I was really excited about this event because of the theme. I think the question that you chose to theme the interaction today, what does it mean to be an English teacher right now um, is a really important question. Um, I think we could expand it to right to being a language teacher because I think a lot of foreign language teachers could relate to this topic as well, whatever language you teach. Um, I think it's really important. It's a lot about community connections and that's something we're gonna address during the presentation. Um, but yeah, the topic really piqued my interest. So I'm happy to be here. Um, and additionally, I wanted just to say to everyone who's participating um, that, you know, this topic and this time has been a really challenging time. And I just want to take the moment, even though we don't know each other in person, just to say thank you to everyone for being part of the community of language education. I think it's really, really um, a, a vital part of the educational space, especially right now. So thank you for your dedication. Um, it's very important. Um, so anyhow, this is what I think uh, we shall do, guys. I have a presentation to share with you. Um, I do invite people to participate however they are comfortable. I know there's a chat on YouTube. Feel free to utilize that if you would like. Um, I'm not seeing the chat because I am on Zoom and not on YouTube. <laughs> but rest assured, I do plan to check it later. So feel free to collaborate with each other there. And later I will check out the chat to see what people had to say. Hey Liz, I'm yes. here on the chat. So any questions that appear here, I'll be mm -hmm. asking. Okay. Oh, At perfect. The end of the chat, oh, I fantastic. All right. Oh, excellent. That's really helpful. Thank you. That's good to know. Wonderful, guys. So that's, uh, yeah, that's where we're going. So let me share my presentation with you. And we'll just go right ahead here. Just one moment. Hold on. Okay. Are you seeing my screen? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Thank you. All right. So we have the topic, again, together while apart social dynamics in the online language classroom. Um, and just to give a bit of an overview to give a sense of where we're going with this topic, um, really what I'm gonna do guys is talk a little bit about some, as, as, as was referred to, some general trends of what has been going on um, over the last year. The way I'm gonna present that information, I know you're all familiar with it. <laughs> We've all been living this. But um, the way I'm going to present it is through the lens of a, a small interview study that I did this June. Mm -hmm. uh, I did a very brief interview project interviewing a lot of um, different language teachers I knew about sort of this topic, actually, that we're talking about today. Um, 
So taking a little bit of a look at that piece of the experience, some factors that came up, some common um, questions people had, difficulties that were occurring, um, surprising you know, moments of opportunity as well. So I'll mention a bit about that. Um, and then what I wanna do is look a little bit at some elements in the learning environment and how they appear in an online space in a way that's a bit different from a physical classroom. And again, I'm sure everyone is familiar with this, but I think it's kind of helpful to dissect, right? And take the pieces apart a little bit. And what I wanted to focus on with that is we're gonna look at some participation structures in the online language, like in a, actually, sorry, in any language learning space. And then what do those kind of participation structures look like in an online class? And what are some things to be aware of, considerations, et cetera. Um, related to that, the role of teachers and the roles of students in that space, and then how the social context that we're in affects those things. Um, and then finally, to wrap it up, I just want to suggest some things to consider, some potential strategies, things that have been useful for me, for some of my colleagues that we've discussed together, um, and that you may find interesting to, to consider, you know and uh, see what works for you in your situation. So that's where we're going. Okay. Now, the next part here, we have some questions for reflection. Now, again, if we were together physically, I would probably encourage you to talk to your neighbor about this. <laughs> we always like to do that, right? Um, but in this space that we're in, I'm just gonna ask you guys to consider these questions. Just give a moment of thought to them. If people are in the chat, feel free to use that. Um, but also, you know, feel free just to let your mind drift over the questions a little bit. Um, so I'll read them for us, why not? The first one is, what has been challenging for you about teaching online this year? Certainly a topic of a lot of discussion, I think. Um, secondly, what surprising moments of humor, delight, or joy have occurred in your classes? Because I think we all have those as well, right? Those unplanned moments that you couldn't, you couldn't anticipate. Um, and then the third question is, what roles have you taken on in this context? You know, I'm sure there are people here in different situations, people who work with um, elementary school learners, high school students, university students, people who do um, professional development for teachers, uh, researchers, all kinds of different roles, student teachers. Um, so you may have different roles to begin with. And then what roles have you additionally perhaps taken on in this setting? And the same thing for your students. Um, and then finally, how have all of these things been shaped by the social context that we're in? And of course, there are some aspects of that that we share because we're connected in a, you know, globally in a sort of situation at the moment, um, but also unique factors that affect your particular situation. And that could be on a national level, it could be a regional level, it could be your institution um, or your particular classroom setting, your particular group of students that you work with. So it could be really macro or it could be really micro, depending on what you wanna think about. And I think there's value to considering all of those factors. So I'm just going to give you guys a really quick example of number two. I'm going to tell you a really quick story about myself. Something very, um, very humorous, in my opinion, that happened that never would have happened in a physical classroom. I was teaching a course in this uh, past session in, uh, well, July of this year. And I had just moved uh, where I was living the previous day. So I didn't have everything set up, the furniture, all of this, you know, set up your nice online classroom space. So I had set up the, my laptop in sort of a precarious position. <laughs> and the apartment where I live, there are several dogs who live here. I love dogs, you know, but so, some of the dogs, they're very active. You can see where this story is going. <laughs> One of the dogs, <laughs> while I was teaching a business English class, <laughs> he somehow opened the door of the room where I was teaching, exploded into the room, <laughs> knocked the laptop over. <laughs> and I heard as the laptop fell off, um, 
I heard the students laughing and also I heard someone scream, <laughs> which is just, it's a silly story, but you know, it was just a moment that we all had a moment together to laugh. It was humanizing, I'm sure for them with me as the teacher, right? Sometimes you present yourself in quite a formal way and then you have the teacher, the dog is trampling over her room and throwing her computer on the floor. Um, but it was just a little human moment, you know, and I think we've all had a lot of those. So kind of a silly story, but I would reflect, you know, encourage you to reflect on those things for yourself too, because I think those are also memorable, right? Um, so anyhow, guys, I'm gonna move right along here. Hold on. Okay. So the next thing I wanted to do, as I said, was to highlight some information about what has been happening in education over the last year, the last, well, since March, let's say, a little less than a year. Um, and of course, that's a huge question, and a lot of people have studied that. Um, personally, from my own part, I did a small interview study in June of this year with 10 participants who are all language teachers um, with some questions for them about how the shift to online learning in such a um, precipitous way, a really dramatic and unexpected way, how it had affected their practice, their students and their goals and this kind of thing. Um, it was a very short term study. It was rather informal. There were only 10 participants. Uh, they were in three different countries. They were in Brazil, the United States, and Spain. Um, all of them were language teachers, as I said. Different types of language teachers, again, probably mirroring the type of participants who are here, university, primary school, et cetera, everything in between. Um, and just I wanted to highlight some of the key things they brought up in their interviews that I think are, are relevant to this topic. So one of the things that they commented on quite a bit about how the situation affected the social dynamic in their classrooms was that it was quite an intense situation. I think we can all agree 2020 has been an intense year. <laughs> um, and a lot of other emotions as well. People talked about how it was um, stressful, it was challenging, very unpredictable. Um, and how often that was mirrored by the students having these same kind of emotions. And that's a lot, right? It's a lot to handle. Um, language teaching is already quite a demanding job. Um, and particularly in a context that's quite, um, quite intense like this. Um, I think that's another layer, right? So this was something that was mentioned quite a bit. Another thing that people talked a lot about was feeling a real sense of responsibility to the students. And this is nothing unique to this situation, but I think it was intensified, you know, because you see that your students have certain needs and you wanna help them meet those needs. And then suddenly we're all thrown into the situation where people suddenly have really challenging emotional needs, social needs that are not being met. Um, perhaps physical economic things as well. There's a lot of layers to it, right? Um, and feeling a real sense of responsibility to um, do their best to assist people with those things. Sometimes with the teachers as well in the same situation, right? Having their own challenges. Um, so there's a personal level to that. And there's also a pedagogical level in terms of the kind of content they were bringing to students, being socially responsive to them, um, and also helping the students continue to meet the goals they had for themselves before all of this happened, right? People have often really big plans. They have, you know, language study plans that relate to their academic goals, relate to their professional plans, uh, perhaps working abroad or moving to another part of the country or, or all kinds of things, right? Internationally related um, fields of work. Um, and, and that's, I'm talking kind of, I suppose, more for older students, but for younger students as well, they're really compelling goals too. Um, and I think, again, there was a lot of sense of, we need to find a way to keep everyone feeling that they're moving forward when there was a real feeling of being a bit stuck or being a bit blocked, you know, really not just a feeling, a reality, honestly, in some ways, um, but finding a way to do that. Um, additionally, another thing that came up in some situations was this idea there's, you know, a lack or availability 
of resources and support, and that really shaping a lot of contexts. Um, and this, again, is nothing new in education. I think we all know a lot about this, but it was, I think, really uh, intensified over the last months, right? Um, additionally, there was a shift in the needs of students and also diversification of needs. I already talked a little bit about that. Um, and additionally, a bit more difficulty sometimes assessing people's needs. Um, and that could be for a variety of reasons. Um, it could be because students lacked the, um, the access or the resources to participate in learning that's done in an online way. Um, it, could it could be because of just the online modality. You know, you're not physically there. You're not physically in front of someone. It's harder to assess what's going on with a person, right? We get a lot of our social cues through those interpersonal interactions. Of course, you can do that online, but it's more challenging, I think. Um, so there's that as well. Also, the role of the home environment, since I would say the great majority of people are working and studying from a home space, or at least were at some point this year, even if you're some people may be physically in a, in a workplace right now. Um, but the way that the space you're in structures what, what your work looks like, who you present yourself as in your professional role, I think is really interesting. And also for the students. You know, you're used to being able to go into a school and you present yourself, I'm the student, I'm here studying this and these are my goals. And suddenly we see you in your home. And those are a lot of different identities that maybe people are comfortable sharing and maybe they're not, right? Depending, family roles, social roles, personal interests, all these other things. Um, additionally, something else that came up was the idea of pacing. Um, that the pace of teaching online is a bit different from the pace of teaching in an in-person classroom. Just the interaction is different. Um, you know, you have to move more slowly sometimes to accomplish less than you would <laughs> in a physical space. And I think, you know, in a way it's, it's different. It's just different. You know, we can accomplish different things um, and the pacing is different. And I suppose that's natural, right? Um, additionally, of course, people felt a lot of personal challenges at this time, the emotional um, uh, weight at some times of being responsible for these different learning activities they're facilitating. Um, and then I just think just the idea of reimagining is really important here as well. This was something people mentioned in a lot of different ways in the interviews that I did, reimagining what their activities look like in an English class, reimagining what it looks like, you know, to present information, your board is gone, you know, everyone, I don't know if everyone loves the whiteboard, I love a whiteboard, you know, um, such a fun tool, so useful, so multifunctional. Um, in reimagining, how does it look to present material? How does it look for students to work together? How does it look to bring the outside world into your class? That all had to be reconceptualized very quickly. Um, and again, in a personal level too, reimagining your own identity in what you're doing every day. I'm not going to the school every day. I'm not socially interacting with my students, you know, in the classroom. What am I doing professionally, reimagining those things? I think there was a lot of that going on um, as well. And continues, continues. I think all of these things are ongoing. So again, that's a little bit about the context. Um, I imagine some of this is familiar. <laughs> I don't think there's anything new here for anybody, but I thought it would be, um, you know, perhaps important to summarize some of those trends because they really inform kind of the things I'm going to highlight and the suggestions that I'm going to present here. So moving to the next piece, um, which is talking about some elements in the learning environment and particularly this idea of participation structures um, in a classroom. How do people participate in a language class, language learning activities? Um, just a few general observations, and then I'm gonna look more specifically at different types of interactions. So the first point, there are differences in different platforms and there are advantages and disadvantages. Are you using Zoom? Are you using Google Meet? Are you doing classes over WhatsApp? I mean, I've talked to people doing all of these things. Are you talking on the phone with your students? Are you texting them? <laughs> Email, I mean, there's a lot of different 
a lot of different things going on. And all of those things have a utility and they all have a use in different situations. Um, and they all have good points and less great points. Um, and I'm sure everybody has their own story about that. Um, and I think it's something interesting to consider is that something which may be a really great advantage for me because of my teaching style might not work for you, right? And something that's a really big disadvantage for me because of the way I like to present or the way I like to design activities, it might not affect another teacher. You know, I think that's a, there's a real complication there in the terms of the way we teach is different. And that I think is kind of affect, it kind of manifests in people's different opinions about, you know, you say, oh, I love teaching on Zoom, but I don't like using Google Meet or, and someone tells you exactly the opposite, <laughs> you know, it's interesting. And I think it can teach us a little bit about ourselves, right? And how we're doing things and how we can learn from others as well. Um, additionally, the nature of the online platforms in general it can make changes to plans more challenging. I would say this is something I've heard from a lot of people, both in the interviews that I did and also just anecdotally in conversations with friends of mine who are who are also educators. Um, and that's that's okay. That's par for the course, but it is challenging, you know, because I think for me, at least I feel one of the greatest like abilities you have to develop if you want to be a teacher, especially a language teacher, you need to be able to change your plans. <laughs> you need to be able to adapt and you need to be flexible. And in a way, you spend a lot of effort developing that capacity. And this situation makes it difficult to utilize that skill in some ways, in some ways, which is, which is fine, you know, I mean, at some, at some point, we will return to physical spaces. Um, I'm hoping, you know, but um, but I think it's interesting to consider um, the fact that there are certain abilities we have developed that we can't really utilize fully right now. And it's okay to feel frustrated about that sometimes, um, you know, and it requires development of different skills. Additionally, um, there are certain behaviors that are typical for people communicating in a foreign language environment that are made easier by online settings and some strategies that are more uh, difficult or less easy to access. And I'll give you some examples to show what I mean. Um, so, and I'm talking particularly if you're teaching a class where the target language is the medium of instruction. This is gonna look a little bit different. For example, if you, your class is in two different languages or maybe you teach in Portuguese and then you teach in English and you alternate, it's gonna be different. Um, but for myself, I, this is, I would, I would say it's focusing a bit on the target language being the medium of instruction, um, but your mileage may vary. You, you decide what you think about that. Um, so for example, in an online classroom, it's a lot easier to be silent. You know, it's a lot easier to turn off the microphone. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. Like everyone needs a moment not to speak, but it's a lot different from the productive stress you can feel in a classroom where someone calls on you to speak, whether it's the teacher or one of your friends, and you feel like, oh, I feel nervous to talk, but everyone is looking at me, so I need to say something. And online, that doesn't exactly happen, depending, you know, if you use the camera, if you can use the camera, if you can use the microphone, et cetera. And if you have a platform that supports that, um, that's possible to do, but it's also easy for that not to happen. So, you know, that's a plus and a minus, I suppose. Um, Additionally, I would say something else that's an example here is the fact that it's a bit more, um, you have to be more explicit if you want help. You know, in a classroom, you are physically in the proximity of the students. So if someone feels um, shy to raise their hand, if they feel shy to ask a question, they can just wait until you look at them and then you look at the students, and we all know that look where someone looks at you and you say, oh, that person has a question, right? <laughs> or they can just wait until you're walking around the room and you're checking on everybody and they say, oh, excuse me, can I ask you something? And it's much less conspicuous than online. 
for example, if you're in a class, like with Zoom and the video, you have to, people see you and everyone is looking at your face, <laughs> you know, and, um, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that, but people do feel um, a bit self-conscious about that sometimes. So something to keep in mind, a lot of these strategies, they work differently in online spaces. Um, additionally, let's see, turn-taking is more challenging for everybody. Um, and that's interesting because turn-taking, I think, is a complex um, discourse strategy to learn in a foreign language anyway. <laughs> when is it my turn to speak? What are the phrases people use that indicate I should go ahead? What are the phrases that indicate someone is done talking? What is, you know, all of these questions? Um, and in an online space, it's even more complicated because you don't have the body language. Um, you may not have the facial expressions or the eye contact or these other cues that make it easier to interact in a smooth way that feels satisfying to people. Um, and I think humor is probably the route to go here because you just have to laugh sometimes. We just have to laugh. Oh, we all started talking at the same time. Okay, you go first and then this person will go and then this one will go, you know, and just have a bit of a laugh about it. Um, additionally, there are some things that are easier. Sharing media is easier. I've found that interesting. Um, personally, myself in the past, I've worked in a lot of spaces where we didn't have access to uh, computers or projectors or things like this, which of course are not necessary, but they're quite useful sometimes, right? Um, and if you're doing an online class, you have those things very easily, you know, easily accessible to you and accessible to your students, which is also nice. Um, it's not just the teacher who is able to use those tools, the students equally have access to that, um, depending on their technological literacy and everything, but, um, but an interesting thing nonetheless. Um, and then finally, just a few general concerns. Obviously, there are some issues in terms of um, technological access, um, data, you know, depending on how people are accessing the internet. And of course, that's different in different countries with different different areas and people's personal situations. Um, the issue of audio and video participation, I already referred to. The camera situation, do you turn it on? Do you turn it off? Do you let the students turn it on? Do you mute them? There's a lot of questions there. Um, and the question of breaks as well. Maybe this is a very simplistic thing um, to mention, but I think it's really important. I always felt like it's important to have a break, right? We all know you need a break no matter what you're doing. If you're working, if you're studying, especially in a target language, you know, as medium of instruction classroom, we all know it can be exhausting sometimes to be in that environment. And additionally, some people are more comfortable working on the computer. Some people are less comfortable with that. They find it more tiring. They may find it difficult on the eyes as well, depending, um, and a lot of other things. So I think just that's an important, really small piece to consider is the importance of, you know, either, either formal breaks or breaks in the way things are, are um, flowing during the class moving from one type of activity to a different type of activity. So even if we're still working together, we're working together in different ways throughout the class. Something to think about. Um, the next thing guys I wanted to move to is uh, specific participation structures. Um, so we have a few of them here and on the next slide. So thinking about participation structures for language learning, Three of them I have here are individual work, pair work, and small groups. And I'm sure we all do all of that, um, <coughs> right? It's very kind of like the bread and butter of language classes is these different types of work. So in terms of individual work, I think this is, is quite curious, right? When you're in an online class, what does that actually look like? Because we're all separate. <laughs> we're all separate in a certain way, but we're also together. I think it's important to remember, just as we want to feel together in the online space, there are some times where you want that feeling that I am doing this activity and I am by myself. <laughs> um, of course, we've had a lot of alone time this year, but I think it's still important. Um, you know, sometimes people find 
um, group and pair work can be a bit socially more demanding or a little bit stressful, depending on how well you know the people you're working with, for example. Um, I think it's nice to give people that moment. For me personally, for those kind of things, I like to um, you know, tell the students, you can turn off the camera if you want, turn off the mic or leave it on. If you want to, you can, <laughs> but you don't have to leave it on. You can take five minutes and go do whatever this activity is and come back. Um, sometimes I turn off my camera, but sometimes I leave the camera on and I turn the mic off and then I leave the room. <laughs> which is not necessary, you know, you could stay, but I just like to give people the feeling like you have a moment to just be with yourself. I think that's kind of nice. I, as a student, I know I would appreciate that. So I like to try and provide that. Um, you know, and additionally, this works different with different platforms. So I think that's something to keep in mind too with, I mean, I, I keep referencing Zoom and Google Meet because they're some of the more popular ones, but it's gonna look different in different spaces. In terms of pair work, it depends on how the platform you're working with functions. Um, I know Zoom is really great for this. I know people do do it on Google Meet. It's just a little more complicated. You have to set up individual meetings um, for the students or, you know, if they're comfortable, like they can text each other or use WhatsApp or something. Um, but I think that it's really valuable, you know, providing that space to work with a partner, also work with a small group is part of this as well. Um, and of course, there's an institutional role here as well. This is not wholly the teachers deciding this. It's going to depend on, you know, the institutions and what kind of access they provide to their staff. And I think that's um, a really important thing to consider, you know, um, for any you know, administrators, right, to keep in mind that, you know, get feedback from your faculty, get feedback from your instructors about what's working for them. Uh, and what's hard, what's hard, what's working really well and what could be improved and taking all that into consideration, right? Because there's a lot of concerns with these platforms, there's security concerns, there's cost, there's a lot of things. Um, but I think definitely it's, it's something, it's an important point of collaboration, I would say, between administrators and teaching staff. Um, final one little point about pair work is just about manually and automatically generated groups. Um, and I find this really interesting on Zoom that you can do both. You can have Zoom automatically create small groups or pairs, or um, you can manually do it. I have to say, after doing it manually for a very large event, <laughs> it, was, it, it was very, let me just say, it was a bit um, stressful in the moment doing it with like many people um, waiting for you to put them in the appropriate group. However, it's wonderful to have that option, I think. I think that's a great thing to experiment with, especially if you have smaller classes. By smaller, I mean like less than 20 people. <laughs> um, you know, it's much more manageable to do that way. You can move the students around. Um, you know, you can, you can respond to how well the groups are working together, um, make any changes as necessary. I think that's a great functionality that Zoom has. In terms of the small groups, there's a lot of similar considerations. One thing that I've noticed personally that's really different, I feel, is visiting <laughs> groups when they're online breakout room groups is very different from visiting groups in a classroom. Um, it's Sometimes I struggle with feeling like it's a little bit obtrusive. <laughs> because suddenly everyone sees you're in the breakout room. They say, oh, hello, <laughs> which is great. And it's great. And I say, hello, everyone. Um, but it's harder to be that unobtrusive observer who's just listening, observing, making notes for things you wanna review after the activity is complete. It's much harder to do that, I find. Um, so again, I think it's a different role you know, I think you go into a different role when you visit a group and it's in an online space. It's more a conversational role, engaging directly with the students, asking um, asking if they have questions because they're in a smaller space. I've noticed sometimes people are more apt to ask questions when they're with a partner in a breakout room, when they're with two or three other students than when they're in a whole group with 20 people. Um, and I think it's great to take advantage of the space to do that. Um, additionally, there's a lot of, I think, there's always the importance of giving clear instructions for activities, but especially 
when you send people to a breakout room, right? Because if you're in a classroom, you can see what the groups are doing. Even if they're across the room and you can't hear what they're saying, you have an idea of what's going on. On Zoom, I mean, who knows where they are? <laughs> Everyone is still there. They're still there and they're doing something, but you have very little sense of what's going on. And the reason I mention this is because if the instructions were not clear of what to do, for example, maybe you put the instructions in the chat of the meeting and the students don't know that the chat disappears when they go to the breakout room. Oh, now we're in the breakout room and we have no idea what to do. <laughs> you know, things like that happen. Um, and I, I myself have seen that happen many times, um, you know, and uh, I try to remember to be really explicit with the students about um, either copying the text on the screen, you know, with the cursor, with control C, or even just like take your phone. If you have a cell phone, just take a picture of the questions because that's really super easy, right? Um, and for some people that's easier than copying the text and pasting it somewhere. But I think it's good to be aware that those things happen and to guide students through that. Um, you know, additionally, I would say too, um, particularly when you have small groups working together, you want to be aware of any limitations of the platform when they go into a breakout room. Can they share the screen? Do they have the permission to share the screen? Can they look at the work together? Um, do the students understand how to use the chat? I mean, probably they all do, but you never know. Sometimes someone might not be familiar with some of the tools. Um, additionally, if you have students who are joining a meeting from a cell phone or a tablet, um, I know sometimes they don't get the documents if you send a document in the chat. Um, and that can be really confusing to people because suddenly they're in the class and they see everyone else has it and they don't have it and people feel stressed out about that. Um, you know, so it's just something to consider, just something to think about, I think, um, because all these things shape how people can be engaged in the language learning, right? They're not being stressed by these other factors. Um, but overall, I mean, I'm a big fan of the breakout rooms. I think they're wonderful. I think if you can access that tool, if you can use a platform that has that functionality, uh, totally go for it. Um, even the free functionality of Zoom, guys, the free meetings, which are short, I know it's limited. I believe it's 40 minutes is the limit. Um, use that for a short activity. You know, if, you're, if your institution uses another, um, another platform, you can have part of your course meeting on the platform you typically use. And then we're gonna do a special activity for half an hour at the end, we're gonna use Zoom. Here's the link, if that's okay, obviously where you work to do that. Um, and I think that can be a great way to incorporate that um, in a way that's accessible to anybody, right? So moving on, we have two more things to consider. Um, in terms of this question of participation structures. So one is whole class activities. I think this is an important thing to highlight because a lot of the time in a language class, right, we're always trying to encourage the students to be the, 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 the dominant voices, right? You want the students to be guiding interaction, taking leadership and ownership of activities, et cetera, um, and not for it to be a lecture. Unless it's a lecture class, then that's fine but a lot of language classes are not intended to be that. And if it goes to online, we don't want it to just de facto become that because of the platform, right? Um, how to prevent the class from becoming a lecture. And I think the key is these alternative interaction patterns, right? So it could be things like we were just talking about using actual functionalities of the platforms like the breakout rooms. But I think it can also be things that, um, that you can use in a physical classroom as well. For example, instead of always I'm the teacher and I pick the next person if we're doing an activity where there's a sequence, very frequently I like to have the students pick the next person. And people sometimes are a little confused about that the first time you do it. They're like, wait, what? You want me to pick the next person? <laughs> but people get apprenticed very quickly into it and they realize, oh, that's what we do in this class you know, um, or if they have a question, sometimes I direct them to ask the other students first, 
I'm happy to answer your question, but why don't we ask everyone else first? And I think that can be a productive way to generate conversation in the class. Of course, there's a moment for the teacher to speak, of course. You're there for a reason, you know. Um, but I think any opportunity you can have different patterns of interaction in the class, have the students giving feedback to each other, um, having the students being directing how how the conversation moves in the in the virtual space, I think is really valuable. Using the chat as well. Some students are more comfortable doing that than, than spontaneously speaking in a video meeting. I totally understand. If you feel more comfortable doing that, you encourage your students to do that. I think that's totally fine. And then I find also that's helpful because you see the comment in the chat and then you ask them, oh, that's so interesting. Like, I wanna know more about that. Can you tell us about that? And it's a bit more of a gentle way to bring someone into the interaction than just calling on someone to speak. It's a bit more conversational and I find it's a bit more comfortable sometimes for people. Um, additionally, you know, the screen share function is really useful, of course, for the whole class. Um, if it's appropriate for the students to be able to do that, definitely do that. Um, I mostly work with adults, so I'm fine with that. If you work with younger learners, it may or may not be appropriate to do that. Um, but, you know, you would be the best judge of that, I think, guys. Um, and finally, I think knowing when not to speak is always really important. I say this in a moment where I'm speaking a lot, um, but I think in a language class, it's always important to know when to stop, right? <laughs> when you're the teacher. And sometimes I think online, that's more difficult because we don't have those other social cues that tell people, you know what, I'm silent right now, but it's okay. We can't see that. So you sometimes people feel the pressure to fill the silence with words. And it's always good, I think, to just, just take a moment before you do that. Of course, everyone does that sometimes, and that's normal. I think that's okay. But knowing when not to speak is uh, really important, I think, for the person who's you know teaching or facilitating in these spaces. Um, finally, I just wanted to touch really quickly on learning centers, guys. I know this is, you know, a little bit different, um, but it is a really common participation structure in language learning spaces, I find. Um, having these physical spaces in an educational institution dedicated to particular things, right? Whether that's a writing center or a language lab or, you know, um, an area where we have the foreign language students meet and they have a conversation group or something like this. These kind of physical spaces I think are really powerful. And, you know, I think we're feeling the lack of that right now. That's something we can't access right now physically. But I think we can try and adapt some of these things. So, you know, how to reconceive those ideas in an online way. Just to give an example, <clears throat> so writing center is a really typical, I think, um, type of a learning center, you know, a space in a school, in a university that's dedicated to helping students improve their writing, get feedback, work with a peer, work with a professor, something like this. Um, and of course, we don't have that in a physical form right now. But you can reconceptualize that space. How can you do that? Okay, you can share documents. We can look at your writing online. I can, we can set up a way to meet online. We can have a video call. We can have a conversation. We can use Google Docs or any kind of shared document where we can edit at the same time um, and talk through your questions together. I think that would be one example. Um, you know, and, and there's a lot of you know, I think with younger learners, if it's learning centers that are very physical, I think that's a bit more difficult to adapt to an online space and maybe something that those younger learners are going to have to be accessing in their home environment, I would say. Um, but, you know, I think it's also something important to accept here that just some things are going to be different for a little while. And that's okay. That's okay. Um, and there's different I think advantages sometimes to doing things in a different format. Also, it really shows you, I think, the value of the things we're doing now and also the way things were done in a physical space um, to really appreciate that as well and really um, feel gratitude for those experiences you had, I think is really important as well. 
of course, looking forward to having them again too in the future. So few other things to consider guys. Um, in terms of the social context, uh, I know everyone knows all about the social context of this year. <laughs> um, there have been a lot of restrictions brought on this year by the situation we're in. Um, and I think a few important questions to consider related to that, thinking about your students as um, users of another language, English in this case, or perhaps other foreign languages as well, is what communities are your learners a part of? How is that related to the language learning that they're doing? What communities are they seeking connection to through the language learning process? And that's gonna look really different for different ages and different types of students. Um, you know, perhaps for younger learners, it might be more the hopes that you have for them in that regard. If you work with really young kids, what are you trying to bring them to? What kind of, you know, communities and spaces are you trying to connect them to if they're really, really young? Um, but for older students, they probably have a more um, developed sense of what kind of academic or professional communities they're trying to access. Um, and I think it's, it's something important to consider at this time. How are, how are we trying to do that at this moment? Um, and additionally, how can you um, maintain and expand the liberatory potential of a language learning space, right? Language learning is so much, I feel so much it's about freedom. It's about creativity and freedom and uh, accessing different perspectives. And how can we continue to do that? Even though we may be feeling restrictions in other areas of our lives. Um, you know, I've, I've had conversations with some of my students about this um, who, are, who are adults. Um, important to know that for this discussion. And, and several of them have mentioned, you know, that it was really important for them to stay connected to the language learning now because it helps them feel connected to the outside world in a different way. And that's something that can bring you joy and it's something that can bring you connection and I think hope as well. And I think all those things are really important right now, our connections with other people and our connection to our hopes and our goals and all of that. Um, in terms of identities, I think these are two things that are always really big in a language learning setting, right? Communities and personal identities. And when you think about foreign language learning, um, you know, we, we learn about how to use the language, obviously. Often you learn about the language as well, you know, um, about, you know, the history of the language, about the grammar, these kind of things, how to use it in a communicative way, the usage. Um, additionally, there's the cultural dimension of learning, like culturally, about the target language cultures, about the culture that you yourself relate to or different cultures you feel you're a part of. Um, and then also the learning that takes place about um, other people, learning about others, learning about other perspectives, and also learning about yourself. I think all of these are different levels of learning that happen in a language learning space um, and things that are looking, you know, in some ways similar now and in some ways they're, they're manifesting differently because of the spaces that we're in, which are a little bit physically separated from one another. So I think it's interesting to consider all those types of learning when you think about the activities that you're doing with your students. How is it connecting them to these different types of knowledge and these different types of um, development, I would say. Um, and, and finally here, really, you know, what imagined identities may your learners be bringing with them into the space? When you talk about this idea that, you know, language learning, it's a hopeful project. You're connecting yourself to something that's beyond you at the moment, right? The language is something that you're incorporating, you're learning, you're apprenticing into this community in some way as a speaker and user of the language. Um, and that's connected to different cultural and social, professional, academic identities that people are developing. And I think it's important and, and also really fascinating to consider what those identities are that your learners are bringing with them into the, into the class with you. There's a lot happening in that Zoom window, you know, um, there's a lot going on. So what I wanna do right now, guys, is move to the final parts here, which is just some considerations and potential strategies that I would 
I would I would pause it to you and take from these what you will take what's useful to you. Um, and some of these are things I've alluded to already. Um, give the students the opportunity um, to direct the interaction. Uh, I mentioned this before with the whole class, giving um, an alternative to the teacher, soliciting a response, evaluating the response, soliciting another student, right? Moving the, the conversation in a different way in the classroom. Um, additionally, I think modeling is really important for that. Um, also establishing norms, um, because this is a new situation. No one really had done this, I think, on this scale before. Um, of course, the online learning is not a new thing. <laughs> it is not new. It's been going on for quite some time, um, but I think not at the scale that we're doing it right now and not in the way that it's happening at the moment. So I think establishing norms, helping the students understand this is how we're doing things here. This is the process. Here are some routines that we're doing. We have certain activities we typically do in this classroom, this online classroom. Um, you know, I think it creates a safe space where you can take risks. And that's really the key. You know, you don't, you, I think you can't really learn a language if you're not willing to take risks, right? It's about risks and making mistakes and mistakes are okay. Mistakes are actually more than okay. They're essential to make progress. Um, and also sometimes make for good stories later. <laughs> um, anyway, a few other things, guys. I think it's important to find different ways to show you value, different ways that students contribute to the class, whether they're speaking, whether they're using the chat, whether they're maybe they're not able to attend like a live class, but they're interacting with you in a different way through email or sending you their work. They're still engaged with the learning. Find a way to acknowledge that I think is really important. Allow space for silence, as we said, always a good idea. Find ways to bring the outside world into the learning space. That's gonna look different for everybody here, depending on what your focus is with your students. Invite learners to share other aspects of their lives. Um, I think, again, this is gonna look really different with different groups of students. I'll just give you guys a super quick example of an activity that I've done with so many groups. And it's so simple and so easy and so fascinating, I have to say. And again, maybe with, with really like basic beginners, this would be challenging, I think. But any, anyone who has, you know, some conversational ability, this is, I think it's good. I just ask the students when they introduce themselves, find an object in the room that you're in and show it to us and tell us a story. So interesting, so interesting. The things that people choose, what they choose to show, what they, did, you know, are kind of, they're showing you a window into their life, right? Into their life beyond who they are as a student. And that's so fascinating to see. So activities like that, I think have a lot of potential here. Additionally, be attentive to the emotional and social needs of the learners. That's always important. Provide as much positive reinforcement as possible for anything that's student directed, whether that's people socially interacting, just chit chatting in the classroom, peer teaching when the students take it upon themselves to explain something to someone else, provide people all of the positive reinforcement in the world because it's gonna encourage people to continue engaging in that way. And also asking questions, of course. And the final thing I would say, it goes a little bit beyond the classroom, but to reach out to the people who support you and um, reach out to support others. Whether those are people in your personal life or your professional life, I think we all really need that right now. In terms of professionally, you know, we all have beautiful people that we know who work with us. Maybe they're our colleagues, maybe they're former students, maybe they're people who work in administration with us or people who are doing research that we know who are interested in language learning. Reach out to those people and support each other. You know, we're the we're the ones who are supporting each other right now. Um, and I think we can take a lot of um, strength from that and create you know, some really beautiful learning experiences by doing that. So those are some suggestions that I have. Um, I do have other questions here, guys. I'm just gonna leave them 
on the screen. This is being recorded. If you want to take time to do some journaling later, check it out. It will be on YouTube. <laughs> um, I did want to say thank you for this opportunity. I really appreciated it. Um, and I know that, uh, Diana, you were uh, monitoring for any questions. I'm not sure if there are questions or Yes, she's yeah. nodding. Okay. Give me, <laughs> let me stop sharing the screen. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, and did uh, you want to highlight any questions? Yeah, we had some questions. Um, the first one is, how do you believe that students, for example, autistic students, could be helped by teachers to deal with, with new technologies. Wow. Okay. That's yeah. a really, that's a really specific question. Um, and it's a really important question. Um, what I would say about that. But is it possible for them to interact, right? With other students in a virtual environment? I mean, guys, I'll give the caveat and say, I'm, I don't have a lot of background in that area. But I would say this would be a good opportunity to consult people who are knowledgeable about this in your institution. If you have people who are really specialized in, in special education, for example, working with kids who have these kind of challenges, I think it's the moment to reach out to them, right? Because they're the experts in that. Um, and I would say also the other people in the lives of the students, like their family, I would say would be really integral in facilitating you know, the learning, because they're familiar with the needs of the kids in that setting. Sure. Yeah, that's what I would say uh, about that. I have one more from Julie. She says that uh, she has teen students, and it's quite hard to keep them active in class. So <laughs> how can, how she asked, how can I ensure quality of their participation? Okay. So I think what I would say is, I think it's a little different if we're talking about a new group of students, you meet for the first time in an ongoing group of students, if you see what I mean. So I think what I would say, if it's difficult to have them being active, I think what I would do is I would scale back my, my plan for the moment of we're going to do this and this and this and this and this today. Today, the goal is that everyone is going to participate in the class. If we have a short conversational activity and we talk about something really simple and everyone participates, consider that a success. You know, if really what you're trying to do is draw them more into the interaction, it's okay, I think, to accomplish one small thing at a time. I would find out what's interesting to them, right? You know the students, what are their interests? What's gonna perk them up? What's gonna bring them into it a little bit? You know, whatever topics or hobbies or things that they like, how can you relate it to things they're already interested in? Um, and also, again, I would say, use those other strategies to give people options beside being everyone on the screen and having to have the courage to turn on your microphone and turn on your camera, encourage them to use the chat and build off of that. Put them in breakout rooms. It's a lot harder to be silent in a breakout room <laughs> with one person than it is with a group. There's more pressure to speak in a productive way, you know? So I would experiment with some of those things. While you were talking about this, some people put their thoughts about the, the breakout groups and saying that it's a great tool for them to use. Um, That's wonderful. I think I have, we have question for, we have time, sorry, for one more question. Sure. Uh, it's, what's your opinion about this, trans, this transition between traditional and the new way to teach with the new technologies? Is it changing all the traditional education theories? Hmm. Wow. <laughs> That's a really big question. Um, I think, what would I say? I mean, I think the situation is impacting our world in a huge way, right? And education is one piece of that. Um, I mean, I think there are some things which are quite 
how can I say, essentially human about how we communicate and how we learn. I don't think some of those things are changing, you know, the power of being in a physical space and learning together with other people. I don't think that's going away. Do I think online learning will be more prevalent after this? Yes. Yes, because I think people have seen that it's possible in spaces where it was assumed that it was impossible or too difficult. So, you know, I think there's some new possibilities, but I also think some of the more traditional ways of doing things, I don't think those are going away necessarily. Of course, but I don't have a crystal ball, so I don't know yeah. <laughs> what's going to happen, but. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, our time is over, but <laughs> <laughs> and we don't have uh, more time for uh, questions. But we can, uh, people from YouTube, you can try to contact um, Liz. Liz, if you want to, I can share your email. Oh, please. People. Yes. You on the chat, I just put on YouTube. Oh, okay, that's uh, fine. Yeah. And uh, we are really thankful that you're here. We <laughs> joined the Thanksgiving <laughs> period. <laughs> it's with the and, theme yeah <laughs> thank you very much and i hope we can meet again even through virtual or physical uh-huh uh -huh. yeah thank you so much diana thank you guys again to breast iso hondoni i really appreciate it and i do hope to see you again virtually and someday physically <laughs> yes. so we'll see what happens thank you very yes. much very much. Take bye -bye. care. Bye-bye. <laughs> so thank you very much, Liz. And now at 5 p.m. Brasilia time. Brasilia time. Uh, we are going to, to have here Marcela Sintra. Hello. Hi. How are you? I was waiting for the moment to turn on my camera. <laughs> That's perfect, right on time. <laughs> How are you? I'm doing great, and you, Hananta? I'm fine, thanks. Good to see yeah. you. Uh, good to see you again. Res um, Hondonia chapter, we love you. We always oh, invite you. <laughs> I love Hondonia chapter. Even though I, I never have time to go to Hondonia, right? It's always virtual in the virtual world but that's fine we are here together that's true for those who don't know she was with us in a previous event and she's here again so thank you very much <laughs> thank you okay. for inviting me here thank you so um let's start with our fourth and uh, last uh, speaker Marcela Sinta, so today she's going to talk about affective language learning, what can teachers do? So in this webinar, uh, we are going to look back at research on the roles of motivation and affect in language learning. We will discuss how this may apply to different contexts in Brazil and to our language learners. Also, we will look at practical ideas that link theory to some of the current scenarios in Brazil, including the pandemic and remote learning, and how teachers can help learners develop skills and may affect language learning and language use positively. Uh, so who is um, Marcela Sintra? She has been working with English language teaching for 25 years. She holds an MA in TESOL, from the University of Nottingham and is a CELTA, ICELT and Delta tutor in Brazil. She is uh, the project manager in the academic area at Cultura Inglesa and is first vice president for Brass TESOL. She has been involved in current development and teacher training and development programs and presented papers in LABCI, Brass TESOL, TESOL and IATEFL conferences. So it's an honor to have you with us today, Marcela. Um, the floor is yours or the screen Thank is you, yours. Hinata. Yes, <laughs> in this case, the screen, right? Thank you very much. It's, it's so hard to do that uh, when you're sitting down, right? 
Um, and I thank you very much for this introduction, like reading the, the, the bio and the, the abstract and everything. And it seems that we are going to do a lot. We are not going to do anything new, apparently, right? Uh, we're going to talk about something that is rather old. Let me share this. Uh, but that is actually being looked at from a different perspective, perhaps. I don't know. I hope everyone who's here with us today enjoys. And if you do have any questions, I think um, yeah. Diana or Renata, right? Yeah, uh, we'll be on uh, YouTube chat. Mm -hmm. So feel free to ask any question. And in the end, we're going to, to uh, ask uh, Marcella to answer Perfect. them. Perfect. So feel free to add the questions there and we can go back to, to those in the end. Thank you, Renata. Thank you. Uh, so affecting English language teaching, not new as I mentioned, and what can we do? Or is there anything we can do? I think that is the best question to ask. Like Liz was saying, and I really, I agree with everyone who's talking about Liz's talk uh, before, like, she could keep on talking and giving us ideas on what to do. And as she said, we have no idea what the future uh, is going to be like. We can guess a couple of things and we're going to guess a lot. So I would like to start with our agenda and with the, the, the whole idea, I'm so sorry about the noise if you can hear that, okay? Um, neighbors remodeling. So with a whole idea on having an agenda, it would mean that we know what, what is to come. I know what maybe I want to say and share with you today, but I have no more ideas on how to practically use some of those for sure, giving us success, right? We're going to guess together because the agenda that I used to have was actually at the beginning of 2020. You see the, well, full of ideas. We all started the year and we wanted to, to do something different and to develop, perhaps start, in my case, a PhD and go into research, do lots of different things. But in March, we were all caught by surprise, right? And we are now here having an event that is online. I cannot see any of you. Like I told Hanata at the beginning, it's very difficult for me to be sitting down and talking to you because I'm sure you can um, see me moving even though I'm tiny on your screen. I, for me to be sitting down and talking to you and not being able to see any of your faces is the end of the world, but it's not the end of the world, right? And we could go back to an agenda on how to look at um, all the positive um, opportunities that we might take from this year, like um, Liz mentioned in the, the previous talk, right? So this is the agenda. We are actually going to look through theory in effective uh, learning um, and some other theories on language learning as well. We're going to go back in history and then try to go forward in terms of uh, practical ideas on, on what we can do and reflect. But the main aim I have with this talk is that everyone here leaves with a question, okay? Um, not a question that you are going to ask in the chat on YouTube, but a question of what else, right? What else can I do? A question for you to um, add to your journal and say, well, let me try and develop this, right? So it is fair for us to, to start then with a couple of questions that this year, more than ever, are very, very important. First one is, why did you start teaching? Why are we here, right? Um, embracing a profession, and especially in this event, Hondonia uh, chapter event, like, what it is like to be a teacher nowadays, right? Why did we start teaching in the first place? And most importantly, why do we keep teaching, okay? Because sometimes 
um, you just stumble stumble over the the profession and you said okay this is what i'm going to do it's fun and then there are moments when we decide it's not that much fun it's a lot of work and we have so much to do we don't know whether we can continue doing that but we are still here uh, like Hinata mentioned and it is true we've been here i've been here for 25 years not here in this chair obviously but here in the profession uh, for 25 years and I still love it and I have my reasons and I'm going to start with a very very short story maybe some of you have heard this story before maybe not the photo I always use the same photo for different stories for that period right you can see me um, I'm the, the girl in the middle, front row, because I actually loved studying. I've always loved studying. And then I would probably uh, stand in the front row because it was the order, as you can see, not by size, age or anything, but the order we chose. There is no organization in terms of an adult, um, traditional organization of a line there, okay? We chose the, 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 the order. And I was very lucky, this girl there at six, me, a couple of years ago, just a couple, decided that I wanted to be a teacher because of another teacher, because of this first teacher I had in primary school. And uh, it was a public school I went to. She had a very diverse class in terms of, um, obviously, if I look in hindsight, now I know this, but before, I didn't have that much awareness. Um, that was very diverse in terms of social, economic, uh, economical background, um, abilities, and skills we had, um, gender, anything. You think of something, we did have that. It was a state school, right? And she did it so, so gracefully and with joy, with a big smile on her face. And one of the main reasons I researched the impact of um, affect in, in language teaching is probably because I had this very affectionate teacher at the beginning of my um, learning life, right? But this teacher, and this is the main point here, but this teacher, she was actually very, very firm. She was very serious, okay? She was really serious. She, she had a smile on her face, but really serious on learning. If you came into her classroom, you would need to show that you were there to learn. Otherwise, you didn't give her any rest. She wouldn't give up on you anyway, right? So she was really serious about teaching, about learning, about everything. Um, and just for you to have an idea, she moved at that time back then, she moved to a house that was across the street from the school I studied at. That's where she lived. Because if anybody needed her in the middle of the afternoon or had a question, we didn't have the internet back then, uh, she would just cross the street and rescue anybody by doing the homework in the library, for example. Um, that was her life, right? Um, so she was very serious. She was very ethical, but that doesn't mean she couldn't bring affect into the equation. Um, she could actually add a big smile, a positive comment, um, the grouping, an effective grouping with the whole class there um, to make us draw and learn how to write. We all learned how to read and write with that very uh, same teacher. And she was very knowledgeable. And all these three things together, they made her a great teacher back then. And they still make great teachers nowadays. Obviously, not only this, right? But the effect is there in the middle of the, all that. And it will always be there for you to be, when you say, oh, that person, that person is a very good, knowledgeable teacher. It doesn't mean they do not have any um, emotion or it doesn't mean that they, they don't bring affect to, to the classroom and to the learning process, okay? 
And I'm not the one saying this. I mean, I am, right? But I'm not the only one. I'm actually drinking from uh, Freddy, our very own Freddy, long, long time ago in um, Pedagogia d'Autonomia, talking about um, the teacher effectiveness and how much it can still come with affect and knowledge because cognition does not mean you do not have emotions, right? So with that in mind, we go and delve deeper into um, some teaching and in terms of learning as well, um, we can look at the emotions from a different perspective. Um, the perspective that we can actually strengthen um, learning in a way by activating this potential by engaging emotions, engaging the imagination. And this was a lot of, a lot, like three decades ago, but still nowadays we have people um, who go and research different methodologies, different ways of working with project-based learning. They all uh, go back to how to engage the senses, the emotions, how to make it more valuable, more powerful in terms of um, learning and development, right? So from Freire, long time ago till nowadays, we are still adding this to the equation, okay? Uh, it's horrible to talk and have nobody looking at me or asking me a question. Um, then thinking of this affect part, um, some people, let's go back to my story there with a the teacher. Um, when I started teaching, some of my students said, and I was um, not, a, how can I put that? I was not that sweet at the beginning because I have a strong voice and I, I'm very energetic. So this can come across or even be very hard on people like, high expectations or things like that. And if you don't organize your expectations, tip number one, if you don't set your expectations right to the students, it's very difficult for you to um, cause a good impression. So I did cause a good impression, but not as uh, much as I wanted to perhaps, right? And some people told me, Marcella, uh, giving them praise or giving them positive comments. It's not going to help you. You have to punish them. You have to threaten them. Otherwise they will never respect you because I was very young when I started teaching. Um, most of us probably, right? And so I looked at them and said, but why do I have to punish them to get respect? This doesn't seem right. And I was still studying, right? And I like this quote very much from uh, the Positive Discipline in the Classroom book, where they say, who or where did we get this crazy idea that to make people feel better, sorry, do better, we have to make them feel worse, like punishing, threatening, etc., causing um, the, the strong negative emotions to stand out to then make them perform better in the classroom or anywhere else for that matter. Um, they are going to do better when they feel better. And let's go back to the beginning and analyze that. Perhaps you can also see um, yourself there. I went back to my expectations towards my learners. They were high at a certain point and I needed to gauge how much I actually wanted them or demanded from them. Uh, one of my learners came to me and said, Marcella, listen, do you know why we're doing everything in your class and we were not doing that last semester? And I said, why? She said, because you believe us. The expectations, they are coming out of your pores in terms of beliefs uh, that you have for your learners. Not, they're not your expectations towards yourself or what you could be, but what they can be. It, it is about them, right, in the end. And this made all the difference. But real world, let's go back to um, 
not the not the utopian classroom because sometimes i do believe everything and anything is possible but we have to go back to uh, a world that is not yet on an equity level we still go to the classroom and i this time i didn't choose any classroom photo um, for us but we still go to many classrooms where everybody sits seats, um, sorry, sits at a, at a desk in rows, uh, looks at the teacher who's talking, and they have tests that are standardized, and this is it. And then we label people who cannot learn, they, these will never learn, especially when talking about uh, language teaching, uh, not specially, but also, right? And these are brilliant students, and there are these in the middle whose names I don't remember. This is very sad, really, when we look at that. But it's very difficult and it's very hard to achieve equity when everybody has the conditions they need, not the same conditions. It's not sit, sitting um, at a desk, the same desk, having the same computer nowadays, for example, or access to the internet, or even um, the same test. This has powerful use, but not necessarily to achieve equity. And if we want to go towards equity in, in a more sustainable world, we need to give people different conditions. And this is really hard because it means that a teacher, um, for example, in a regular school with different lessons and 200, 300 students per semester or more sometimes, um, they would need to think about them as individuals and if you have a double shift or a triple shift for example that means you have like a thousand students to look at and and understand and find the right conditions right building repertoire helps a lot but we are not fooling ourselves that there is a long way to go there's still a long way to go this is our dream right then if we go back to language teaching, all the, the affect and, and uh, positivity and bringing learners, listening to them, bringing them to an equitable classroom, um, we can look at the different learners in this classroom. And I know that Liz mentioned a lot of um, um, situations that happen nowadays on Zoom, where we look at everyone and students have um, access to the internet, they can listen to the teacher, they look at everyone else. It's not the classroom where the illusion of control was probably higher, I don't know, right? But here, maybe the illusion is even bigger, but Nobody's looking at you right now. I could be talking to myself, for example, or to the neighbors, and I don't know what's going on. And in language learning or in learning, um, in any case, we do need something to stand out. We need to focus, right? We need to choose. And um, like Arnold says, um, focus on what is important and this will help us pay attention. And what she says is that the emotions or the attachment can actually help you stress things easily or more effectively in a way. Uh, what does that mean to us on Zoom here? And Liz was talking about making learners or helping them participate more actively in the interaction. Definitely not what we're doing in a webinar, obviously, but in a regular classroom or a workshop when we can interact is to help them feel part of that first, to help, to help them have a say, for example, more frequently. And remember what I said at the beginning, using what we already knew or read about decades ago about learner participation agency and everything but maximizing it in um 
in online uh, or remote lessons, right? Um, so if we want them to actually learn, we need to connect with them. And if we think about a language that they want to learn, if they do not participate, if they do not engage, they're not producing and the object that we want them to learn is actually within all that to make it happen. So we need them to produce, we need them to participate and to communicate um, within the, their scope, right? Um, again, the emotions, and we look at with um, anxiety, um, everybody looking at you, or in a Zoom class, you are afraid that people might be taking photographs and you will never know because we're online, they could be taking screenshots and using that. Teenagers, they're so afraid and it's not, a, it's not necessarily an issue uh, that they are disconnected, but sometimes because they are anxious about that. And sometimes they do not turn their microphones on because they are anxious. Sometimes they don't have a microphone. And if we're that um, teacher that does not know whether they have a microphone or not, for, for instance, and we force them all to speak, same conditions, this may raise anxiety. And what Rebecca Oxford says is that the anxiety, language anxiety, is very serious, very, very serious. If we look at research in that area, we're going to see that this may prevent people from learning a language. So now talking specifically about uh, being a teacher nowadays, a language teacher, and not being aware that there are emotions the anxiety they bring in or the anxiety that we maximize perhaps um, being unconscious about, um, we unconsciously maximize anxiety in the classroom. This may reflect how much they succeed in our classes, okay, in our lessons. Yeah, so everything comes back to this awareness of um, the theory there. And if we look at all the anxiety, but Marcella, where's the positive thing? Everything is positive. If we are aware of that, we may actually um, refrain from um, inducing more anxiety and calming ourselves down because we also know that we are all in, in the classroom, in the same situation, and the contextual um, influence is another um, possibility. And the emotions, if you're calm, and this goes towards psychology there, uh, to show that someone, a teacher, who's actually rushing students through the stages of a lesson because you want them to finish the lesson, finishes, nothing at all sometimes, because if I taught and they didn't learn, there was no teaching, right? Uh, and if they are not with me at all times, what am I doing, right? Let's go back to my first question. What am I teaching? If, why am I teaching? If I'm teaching, it's because of the learners, just like my teacher, my teacher at the beginning did. And if that is not working, maybe nothing else works, right? Um, so being aware that peer pressure, teacher, uh, teachers rushing through the lesson to achieve, and again, remember what I said about the ideal world. We can reach the impossible if we all work together towards believing that we can do that and changing what we've always done. Because what we've always done might not be the best thing. Because if it were, 
uh, I think everybody in Brazil would already uh, speak English very well, because I've been doing this for 25 years, so I could have taught and my peers as well, obviously, so many people and spread so much, but I still believe it can be done if we all cascade this up and down uh, towards uh, learners' success, okay? Then, um, this is another um, work on motivation, because we were talking about this social and contextual influence but there is also what the teacher or the teachers can do in terms of um, projects that are stretched throughout the year, uh, that are stretched um, together with other teachers, for example, to actually direct the motivation of the learners or their interests and change the questions we are asking them. For example, I'm trying to simplify it a little bit in terms of practical um, ideas. Um, but the questions we ask them, if it doesn't work, try a different question, try a different project and bring them um, towards engaging in the tasks and sustaining this um, behavior in terms of I want to participate, for example, or I want to collaborate, I want to open my microphone because I'm part of this group, I feel I belong and I'm in a safe environment. So the word safe there is going to be important as well, okay? Um, then if we want to put it all together and bring it back towards the teacher, again, and I bring theory as I mentioned, because it's not only my belief because it is very strong, you might realize that, but it's still, um, back in theory, in reading and everything. And what the teacher does and how the teacher behaves in class reflects everything uh, and the learners can see that. So if I remember what I mentioned about the students who said, um, you believe we can do, and then we are making an effort. And then you just praise us for doing what you believed we could do and they would reach even higher. So our beliefs, they're not going to be hidden. You cannot think, I'll give you a very practical example. Um, having a student who didn't get the, the answers right or who's not uh, developing as I wanted uh, the student to develop. And then I, come to class and I say, no, he can do it in my mind. Whatever I say will reflect this, he can do it. But if my behavior is, I have a student, I talk to a peer, for instance, I have a student who will never learn. That is impossible. This will reflect whatever you say, it's just going to look at you. They're just going to look at you and say, mm -hmm, those, those are empty words. It's an empty discourse. It don't believe that and then I don't make any effort, okay, to put it in practical terms. And um, the drop, that, that the image is there because this is reinforcement, again, on research, and now not only in, um, that was for English language teachers, this is more general, um, on the beliefs and practices, attitudes, whatever you do, inside and outside the classroom and how much you, be, you believe or not in education, in what you do. Remember the first question, this is going to affect everything you do. And this is going to affect how the learners are going to uh, develop. Sometimes we are the ones who need support. Sometimes meaning 2020 from March onwards, right? And this is why we're here. I think Hinata and the whole Brastisol uh, Hondonia chapter thought of an event that would actually add a drop to the um, together, togetherness of the Brastisol, for example, and the safe network where we can actually help each other. I'm not going to be uh, positive or joyful in every lesson or every Saturday, Sunday, etc. 
but the more I have it in me, the better it will be for my learners. So if I need to go back to that girl on that picture, and that's why I carry it with me, I have to. And if I cannot do it alone, because I don't believe we can, that's why I'm here. That's why I'm part of a group. And this is going to affect uh, all our learners in turn, okay? Uh, it, I, I know it sounds very philosophical because it is, but 2020, right? Then if we go back to the English, we went away a little bit and came back to the English language teaching, we talked about knowledge that we need to have in terms of theory. Uh, some of the skills we might need to acquire and practice. And nowadays, I mean, 2020, we need to acquire different skills that nobody thought maybe we would need in this year, but maybe we were late, maybe we were not. We don't know, it depends on the case. Um, would anyone dream of what we are doing right now in January this year? Maybe, maybe not, right? But the knowledge and the skills are what we are doing. We are studying and we are trying to practice and we are learning how to use the breakout rooms more effectively to our learners or anything else, right? But the attitude, I need to keep developing this. And even though I can use feedback from others to work on that, make me aware and, and affect how I'm going to use um, my own beliefs to develop my skills and my knowledge. If I don't change anything there this year, I'm just going to keep doing what I did in a regular classroom. And it's not going in a regular classroom. I mean, what's regular, right? There is no regular. Yeah. But if I don't learn anything new because I don't believe this can be done or this can shift towards something different that we know nothing of in 2021, maybe it's not the right attitude towards teaching because believing that learn learners can change learning implies change, is also believing I can change and you can change and everyone can grow, right? Some practical ideas um, for us on a list here uh, of things that I can do. We mentioned the attitudes, right? And here I'm going to start and give some examples, some real practical examples for us. Um, if I think of attitudes nowadays, it's very easy for us to sit behind the, the screen here, plan the lesson, teach the lesson, mute the students, for example. Um, it's easier if I'm thinking about Zoom, it's easier for me to mute the button. And this can be a solution for old discipline issues that we used to consider uh, like in discipline or something, students talking. Or I can look at that from a different perspective. If everybody has their microphone open and now it is a lot more evident when somebody is speaking, if their microphones are open, I can use that to teach more about how to communicate with people we teach language, right? So more on how to ask a question and wait more on, you can shift it to a very positive perspective and um, organize or reorganize the attitudes you have on screen and off screen, right? Um, in terms of effective learning and believing they're using the microphone to, to do their best rather than they just want to disrupt the classroom. Because behind the disruption, there is somebody that maybe needs more attention now than they already did in the physical classroom, right? So if I go back to that and I think of how I can bring this attention uh, in a 
positive, empathetic uh, attitude, maybe this is going to change uh, their reaction as well. Uh, in terms of habits, remember what I said about our um, well-being, right? So I talked about the learner and how much empathy they need. But nowadays, if I have 10 different lessons and I have to be on screen 100% of the time, otherwise it's not a lesson, it's not really different from saying that we needed to be in the classroom and students needed to be sitting at their desks all the time, otherwise it was not a lesson. Question, how can we change that? How can we bring back a little bit of the action that is not going to substitute nothing and nobody can be replaced um, by something that is equally important or equally effective or equally something that you want to complete it with because everything is going to change what happens, right? So if I'm sitting at the computer, completely different from um, it being in the classroom, in my case, and remember, everyone is going to bring something to the um, equation, to the diversity of the classroom. If I'm sitting at the computer and I say, okay, we are all going to have one minute to get some drink and I've got water, of course, I was sitting here and I do have water because I need to drink water for my health, but I could go and grab it. Or uh, it could be a challenge of go and ask this question to somebody in your house right now, depending on the group I have, because I know whether they do have some somebody in the plant in a home to ask the question to or not. Um, go and find a different notebook, we are taking notes, I don't know. Or, depending on your context, um, and I do that at work, believe me, I really do. And if somebody from work listens to this, they will know that I do that. Uh, in the middle of a meeting, I stand up, I'm going to do this now with you. I stand up and I start walking around the house with a computer because I can do that. It's, it's a laptop. So I'm, I just said this briefly because I don't want to drop it. Um, it's going to be recorded. If I drop it, it's going to be a shame. Yeah, who's going to say that, right? So you walk around, you grab some coffee, you can teach a lesson from another place. This is remote teaching because it's not the ideal condition. And again, like Liz asked, are we going to, to do this forever? I don't know. It's going to change education because people now understand a couple of things that they didn't before or have more questions about what they never thought of asking, right? But I don't know. And if it is the situation nowadays, let's try to think, to think about that with a positive look. And changing the habit may change what happens in the classroom more than anything. Because... Um, standing up in the middle of a class and saying, okay, I need to stretch. How about you? I do too. Okay, I'm going to turn my camera off because nobody needs to see me stretching, for example. And we have a minute to stretch. Again, changing our habits to think about human beings and the condition that uh, we are going through all together, right? Um, it's completely different from being in the classroom. So maybe we need to learn new habits that we didn't know of. Or a habit for the teacher. I finished this class and I have five minutes to the next one. You leave the computer. Close your eyes for a bit. Um, I don't know. Get a book. Stand up. Call somebody. Call somebody. That's very important. We are not alone in the world, right? Which brings us to the next um, teaching tip, right? The, the whole staff, the teaching staff or administrative staff in the schools you work at, these are people who are going through 
the same pandemic, but in different in a different way, learning about how they are going to um, cope with that or what they are doing may also help us understand how learners may be coping with that without asking them sometimes, right? Because maybe we couldn't ask them, but we know um, that they might be doing something um, different because it opens our mind to different things. It says your contribution here, but it only means that anybody who's listening to this at this moment, at this time, on a Saturday afternoon, contributes a lot more than they probably think they do, because we are very hard on ourselves, teachers and people in general. But listen, you were learning or um, completely out of your comfort zone, sitting on a Zoom, no, not a Zoom, you were on YouTube, listening to somebody, thinking about that, writing down some questions that you may want to have for 2021 in terms of how I can engage my learners or motivate them when we don't know what's going to happen in the future, right? Um, you do contribute. So write down what you contribute, what you bring to, to, to the table as well, right? Is it more affect? Is it more questions? Is it, do I actually brighten people's day? Or am I the person who's complaining too much and not thinking about a possible solution? Because we, do, we all have something to complain about because it's all wrong for everybody, right? I mean, I don't want to leave the house because I'm afraid of um, killing somebody actually more than anything. I do have a family, right? So we, are, we all have something to complain, but what is it that we have that is positive in that um, sense, right? Building trust with your learners, with your peers. If you work alone here uh, in an association, enrolling in a different course, um, careful with um, lots of different information coming from different places, right? Um, and being cohesive in a way that you are coherent with your own principles of teaching going back to the beginning of how you started teaching nowadays, right? Um, before the questions that you might want to have, I have one last point about, which is a tip now, about teaching uh, in remote learning here. I'll give you one second to think about the picture and tell me whether this is the teacher or the student. You don't have to tell me because you don't have microphone for me to listen to you. But suppose you thought about that for a minute. I did this test with um, some peers and people looked at the picture and said, oh, that's the teacher. I said, really? We now have a chance to look back at equity in a different, in a different sense. Before the pandemic or not before because we did have online teaching, but now that we moved the classes temporarily online, everybody logs in onto the same platform. You can make anybody the host of your Zoom meeting, for example. Um, people can ask questions at the same time. We don't know by looking at a person sitting at a computer, we have no idea who the teacher is or who the, learner, the learners are. We have no idea. And this is great because it's a chance we have to bring everybody more equitably to the, to the equation of learning, uh, helping or encouraging more learner participation than we perhaps had the chance to in the past, depending on the circumstances or the context um, you taught at. And this makes the affect part even more important, like embracing everybody and all the opportunities in the classroom and embracing, I don't mean hugging people, 
that's not what effective learning is. It could be, but not necessarily. And definitely not even close to that. Because by listening to people with empathy and acknowledging their presence, thinking about all those attitudes, believing they can learn and et cetera, is a lot more than a hug. And we can still do that in um, remote teaching, okay? Uh, here are the references for us. And I'm going to leave all my contacts here. As another red, um, uh, first vice president, president in 2021 for Brass Diesel. I'm here representing uh, Faculdade de Inglesa, which is sponsor, sponsoring Brass Diesel. And if you do have any questions about any of that or any of um, any of the questions I actually pose throughout the talk, this is now the time to ask, I think. Thank you very much for listening and I hope to see you um, in person in the future. <laughs> right, Anata? Right. <laughs> we all hope that we are going to be able to do that soon. So thank you very much. It was amazing. Thank you. Your talk. It was really thank good. You, we have many compliments for you in uh, on the chat box of YouTube. So people are saying uh, thanks for those good thoughts. Um, and these tips were really helpful. Uh, really oh, good reflections. You. And Elisangela, she said a very beautiful thing. And it, I really believe that and it really matches with what you said is that she said that is that is it people do better when they feel better yeah. so that's the key yeah. that's so yeah. important yeah i always remember and now i can make a joke about that it's um i'm not sure everybody watched the monsters inc when they it's the old one 2001 i think the first one uh when boo the girl goes into the monster world and they all, they're all scared because that they want to, um, they feed on screens, right? Which is causing fear, causing negative emotions. And they find out that when they cause positive emotions and laugh, they have even more power and energy to their city. And I mean, this is actually based on theory. Of course, it's the, the movie representation for that, but this is it bringing positive emotions to the table is a lot more powerful than bringing negative emotions. And if we find this in the classroom, we can do more miracles with our learners. That's true. So we have one only question, which is from Tamara. And she asks, um, we all struggle with learning how to use technological tools. How can we deal with our students feeling when it comes to their digital literacy? Wonderful, very, very good question, Tamara. Um, uh, because we all struggle with that in all classes, right? Um, digital literacy is, I think, the, the key. I mean, it's what we found out that we didn't have, not we uh, here in the room, but in general, teachers and learners, right? Because using the tool is still not literacy or knowing how to, to do research online, etc. cetera. Um, Tamara, my personal take on that, which is what I've been trying to do is, and as I mentioned, the brushing through the stages will not be enough. So our goal has to be to help them learn something. And if they need, to become more literate in terms of digital technology or anything, we need to spend time on that with the group. So we need to cater for that as well in the classroom or outside the classroom if possible with um, tutorials or different things. Because first thing is we need to be patient with ourselves and with the learners for that, because it's going to be difficult and it's going to raise anxiety um, even if we allow them to share screen, for example, they don't know where to click or they don't know what to share or they are sharing something different. So teaching them step by step at the beginning, going back and not assuming that they know um, 
we usually help um, students who are very young or older in a way as a general rule, but no, nobody knows how to do that. Even teenagers need to, to become more literate. So as language teachers, we have the opportunity of helping them with different skills as well. So why not including some digital literacy in the curriculum? That's nice. I would say do spend time with that because otherwise it's going to be an obstacle uh, towards learning, right? That's true. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marcella, Thank you. very much. Thank for, you. Um, Thank you very much. Samara said, absolutely. She really agrees with you. And yes, everybody is facing the same problem nowadays. It was amazing to have you as our uh, last speaker. Because when we, when we think about this question, what does it mean to be an English teacher today? We have to be aware that we have to keep willing yeah. to make difference in our students' life. That so, yeah. is the key. And that was really amazing, your final like uh, talk. And I think that's the, um, the key of our work, of our job. As I said, it's not possible to be every day like that. But as much as we can, and better for together, our right? Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much, Renata. Thank you, everybody in Hondonia chapter and everybody who's listening. I'm I'm going to Bahia now. <laughs> <laughs> ah, that's true. Okay. <laughs> bye, bye bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. So now we are getting to the end of our event. But as we said in the beginning of our event, now we are going to do, um, but before that, I will just share my screen one minute. Um, So we'd like to thank all the sponsors, uh, Marcela Sintra uh, from Cultura Inglesa, Braid, Digizal, Dizop, National Geographic, SBS. They are our national sponsors. So we thank them very much for being, you know, um, uh, with us in helping um, for the Brust to be, to exist, to, to work and to connect people. That's really amazing. And we have a regional sponsor, which is Albus Idiomas. And I'm going to uh, give the word <laughs> to um, um, Gianna. And she's going to talk a little bit more about Albus Idiomas. And then in the end of our talk, of our, of our, our event, we are going to have a lucky draw. And uh, I think Gianna can, can start to... to to do that, Jana. Hi. <risos> ah, então, a, a Alba de Idiomas, ela é uma escola de idiomas online, então, mesmo, né, a gente estando aqui, ela é, foi criada, digamos assim, no Acre, mas mesmo ela estando em um estado diferente, não tem importância, tá? É, e a Albus tem uma, uma metodologia de ensino própria, focada na, na comunicação, tem professores qualificados e tudo mais, tem é, muita coisa para falar sobre a Albus em pouco tempo, digamos assim, né? Mas dá para dar, é, se você quiser ter mais informações, é só... Uh, acessar o Instagram, que é Albus Idiomas, é facinho de achar. E aí nós vamos sortear, né? Três, uh, três bolsas, digamos assim, de 50%. É, para Uma bolsa, no caso, né? Para três pessoas de 50%. É, no valor dela, e aí eu acho que é bem legal, e aí eu, eu, a gente pede a colaboração 
de vocês que estão aí no YouTube, porque nós vamos fazer aí um, um quiz <risos> sobre hoje, mas assim, não tá difícil, tá? É só porque a gente precisa dos dados. E eu vou colocar o link no, no chat do, do YouTube. E aí eu vou compartilhar aqui a tela e nós vamos fazer o quiz. Eu não sei se a Tamara gostaria de, de acrescentar alguma outra coisa. Não sei se ela está podendo falar. Tá por aí, Tamara? É, sou eu, ah, eu, eu posso falar? Eu não sei se eu tô... Se, eu, se as pessoas estão me ouvindo. <risos> yes, we are hearing you. Ah, ok. Ah. We are not hearing her anymore. Yes, now you are back. I don't know, maybe you can start, Gianna, to doing the mm -hmm. lucky draw. And let's see who will be the winner. Or three people who will be the winner and will get 50% of uh, this um, English course, right? Uh, it's for one semester, this 50%, and they call it a uh, gold plan, right? Mm -hmm. Gente, do Desculpa, é, demorou aqui, né, Diana, para me colocar como panelist, e aí demorou para chegar. Nossa. Mas eu acho que uma coisa interessante em, em falar sobre a Albus, né, aproveitando aqui enquanto a Diana set o quiz, é que essa é uma escola que foi criada com um propósito é, muito interessante de tentar é, facilitar o acesso de pessoas a um curso de idiomas. A gente sabe que há muitas escolas, né? E, mas nem sempre é um preço acessível, digamos assim, para quem é mais é, baixa renda e tudo mais. E a Albus ela tem uma proposta, justamente por ser uma escola online, de conseguir fazer preços melhores, né? E com um ensino de ótima qualidade, professores super qualificados, material... É super tecnológico, interativo, vale a pena conferir. E aí, três pessoas aqui hoje vão ter a oportunidade né, de ter aí é, 50% de desconto na, por um curso né, durante o semestre né, na escola. Eu espero que vocês façam um bom proveito. Então, eu estou colocando aqui... Obrigada, Tamara. É, eu estou colocando aqui o o link do, do, do nosso quiz, você só precisa entrar, acessar o link, colocar o seu nome certinho, e aí já vai aparecer aqui na nossa tela. E aí daqui a pouco eu coloco para iniciar. Vou esperar um pouquinho para vocês entrarem, porque tem esse delay, né? Do YouTube. Um minutinho e a gente começa. Olha que legal. Yes, we have two people. Vamos ver quantas pessoas. A gente tem 12 no momento. Só acessar o link. Colocar o nome. É, enquanto o pessoal entra, é, a gente gostaria de, é, de, de destacar né, a importância de ser associado ao Brustiso, e, e é uma associação muito importante, né, Associação de Professores de Inglês do Brasil, e é, quando você é membro, né, você tem várias vantagens, então é interessante, para quem tiver mais interesse, gente, a gente vai colocar aqui também o link para vocês é, se, é, para serem associados, né? Cadê? Cadê os nossos nossos participantes? Eu 
Lembrando que esse, essa ferramenta, conforme você vai respondendo, quanto mais rápido você responder, você ganha mais pontos. E aí, isso que vai fazer o ranking final, tá? Os três primeiros lugares serão os, os três primeiros sorteados. Será que eu já posso? Oh, só tem quatro pessoas aqui, né? Uhum. Será que alguém mais vai entrar? O que você acha? Eu faço? I think, yeah, I think it's inside. Tem gente entrando, entrou mais aqui. Sou Josefa. Para a Tereza, eu vou aguardar. Está entrando, pessoal. Vou dar mais um minutinho aqui, quando dá 5 e 5 no meu relógio, aí eu começo. Vamos lá, vamos lá. Então, vou começar. Que vença melhor. Tá bom? É... Coloquem ali o e-mail. Pra... É, eu pedi para elas colocarem o telefone, aí a gente entra em contato com... pelo WhatsApp. E é isso, né? Por enquanto aqui, a gente encerra essa parte. Thank you very much. You see how the world will be like this, like this amazing girl. Diana, you rock it. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody, for being here until this time. Six, seven, or five, seven in Rondonia. So thank you very much for everyone. And I think we can finish now. Thank you very much. See you in the next event of Rondonia Brastiso chapter. Bye. Yay, bye.